on the committee wrote down a rate cut this year. Fed Chair Jay Powell signals more hikes this year after the FOMC keeps rates on hold. The PBOC lowers the rate of its one-year loans, ramping up stimulus as the Chinese economy deteriorates. Asian stocks move higher, the dollar gains. And the ECB is expected to raise rates by a quarter point later today. Markets, of course, will be watching for the outlook from President Christine Lagarde. Also watch out for the banks. And, of course, we'll be live in Frankfurt. Now, let's take a look at the futures. A lot of the focus, it's all about central banks today. Let's not kid ourselves. No one cares about anything else. We look at the dot plot, of course, of the Fed. And then I would point out everyone to a wonderful piece written by our John authors that asks a very simple but profound question. If we see such a hawkish tilt, then why not res rates uh, from the Fed? Equities are open. You can see the Spanish index down four tenths of 8%. The FTSE is practically unchanged. The other story we're watching here in the UK is, of course, there's a review on some of the forecasting from the Bank of England. The other uh, question that we ask is, is the UK now unlistable? We have We Soda. We have an interview with the chief executive coming on a little bit later that decided not to list for the moment. The other story is, of course, commodities. Uh, what the China stimulus from PBOC means, for example, from oil consumption, oil demand, but also some of the iron ore and things they need to build some of, of course, the construction that's going on over there. Then I look at sovereign bonds. Foreign exchange, always interesting to look at British pound, 126.47. And then we also have the CAC 40 opening three tenths of 8% lower. If you look at the cross asset, there's only one thing we care about today, and that's probably treasuries and dollar. You can see the US year, two year yield at 47416. And then dollar, we like the Bloomberg dollar index. So we'll also do it through a basket of currency, but the dollar, Bloomberg index, 1,231. So the Fed has paused following 15 months of rate hikes signaling they would likely resume tightening at some point to cool inflation. Emmanuel Co, head of European equity strategy at Barclays, now joins us. Emmanuel, thank you for, for coming on. I mean, they were quite hawkish. And I don't know whether the markets really believe that they were hawkish or it's a, just a little bit of a sigh of relief that uh, they didn't hike yesterday. Yeah, good morning, Francine. It was a hawkish pause for sure. And I think my takeaway is that the Fed is very much undecided about the pass um, of, of rates ahead. They told us that the, the next meeting will be probably a live meeting. So the Fed is very data dependent. And to some extent, they have probably good reason to be data dependent because the data is all over the place. It's very hard to interpret. We see some cracks here and there. We see some of this inflation, but we also have this very, very tight labor market, which is forcing um, the Fed to keep a uh, hawkish, uh, hawkish bias. But look, I'm not really sure the Fed uh, moves the needle, right? The market was expecting this kind of outcome, and that's what we got. But, I mean, I mean, the data is all over the place. I'll grant you that. But why is it all over the place? Are we counting it wrong? Is it a COVID legacy? Or is it just these adjustments that, that means that the path forward is very difficult to see? But we have to understand that we are getting out of three years of extraordinary situation. We have a pandemic. We had a war in Ukraine. There was so much... Um, unusual events that distorted the data that probably the data has to be taken with a pinch of salt. Um, so we are late in the cycle. We are late in the tightening cycle. We start to see the transmission mechanism having some impact on lending condition, on banking sector, and on the inflation as well. So I think it makes sense for central banks to give it a bit more time and not to be committed to a particular outcome.
But so, what's the probability of a recession? So there are two titans. First of all, Gundlach says, look, he doesn't think the Fed will resume rates, rate hikes soon. Uh, that's a little bit of an outlier call. We also heard from, uh, you know, some uh, another giant saying that they're loading up on credit because we're going to see a recession in the U.S. Well, it's a yield curve. It's telling you that recession is coming. I think the timing is the uncertainty, yeah. but the direction of it seems to be pretty clear, right? But the markets don't believe it. Well, it depends which market. The bond market it seems to be pressing in the recession, but the equity market uh, gives the impression that it is pressing a much more positive outcome. And I think from an equity market standpoint, what matters here is the earnings, is the growth data. I don't think central banks are the big driver anymore because the equity market had to adjust, had to absorb a meaningful move in rate over the past 12 months. We had a meaningful valuation adjustment, yeah. but now you can say the bulk of the rate hikes is largely behind us. What will matter from here is whether earnings carry on and keep uh, supporting the equity market, or whether earnings start to confirm that recession is actually coming. Okay, and I want to ask you about equities in a second, but I do also have to bring you my morning must-read, which is from one of my favorite authors from Bloomberg Opinion. He's John Authors. And basically, to put very simple, Emmanuel, he says this was an unequivocal hawkish surprise from the Fed. The question now arises, if there's so much more convinced that rates need to be higher for longer, why pass an opportunity to raise them now? So do you think there's a worry about the banks? Are they worried about markets? And is that why they're pausing, or they just want to see how it plays out? I'm not sure they're worried. They must be somewhat happy about what they are seeing, that inflation is coming down. You know, we got uh, softer PPI yesterday, CPI was in line. You start to see some, you know, softening uh, under the hood in the labor market. And as you said, Francine, you know, we had clearly some issue in the banking sector, right? So I think it kind of makes sense late in the, in the rate cycle for the Fed to give it some time and, and to be much more nimble in the way that they look at the data. But do earnings make sense to you now? And again, there's something, I mean, it's really quite extraordinary that we can raise rates from zero or 1%, 5% without anything major happening with companies? Well, a lot has been done after the financial crisis to strengthen the private sector. So everything was done to avoid another GFC. So we've seen deleveraging in the corporate sector, we've seen deleveraging in the banking sector, in the consumer sector. So the private sector is in a much better shape to absorb these rate hikes, but it's just a matter of time. And what we don't know is how long does it take yeah. for the central banks to hit. But still pretty incredible, right? To, to, it, to raise interest rates so rapidly and us being okay. Yeah, but bear in mind that you also have a lot of fiscal uh, in the play as well. There was massive fiscal stimulus uh, in the last couple of years. Excess savings are still relatively high. So consumers can cope with higher rates up to a certain point. And again, we see some cracks um, in the housing market, um, in, in the labor market. So we start to see that the transmission mechanism is working. I guess not enough for central banks to reverse course. Uh, but I think it kind of makes sense for the Fed to be a bit more prudent in their communication, at least. So, so how do you see the consumer behavior changing? And what does that mean for earnings? It seems that, you know, people still have quite a lot of savings from, from COVID. People are willing to spend on, on holidays. I don't know whether because they're fed up or it's just the summer months. But how does that change into the winter months? Well, there is still some pent-up demand. And again, the key driver of uh, spending is the labor market. And as we speak, you have strong wages, full employment. That should put a floor under consumer, and in some cases, the kind of uh, disinflation we are seeing with gas prices, energy prices coming down, should be a relief uh, to the consumer and provide a bit of you know disposable income support. So that should hold into the summer. Now the question is whether into winter you see much more sign of, of labor market weakening that will ultimately take us to this recession. So we start to see some sign of maybe, you know, um, kind of down trading in the U.S. in some segment of consumption. So something that to keep an eye on. But broadly speaking, when you have full employment, uh, earnings tend to be supported by consumption. Where, where do you want to be invested? There, there still is quite a big European discount. And I don't know whether that's justified or it's mainly American big funds looking at Europe and just not wanting to touch it. Well, I think the kind of valuation comparison between Europe and U.S. is a bit unfair, right? Because U.S. has this mega tech, you know, very strong tech leadership. If you strip out these 10 or, you know, 10 stocks which are driving the index, you end up with a much more, I would say, affordable U.S. equity market. Look, we think there is a lot of value in Europe. Um, and to me, the new story in town is China, because we all talk about, you know, the central bank's hiking rate and tightening policy in the Western world. But in China, you have the PBOC now rushing or doing more to support the economy. So the growth policy mix in China is changing, it's turning much more favorable in our view, and we think some of the China exposure in the market, uh, in Europe in particular, start to look interesting. 
Okay, I mean, I mean, you can take that as a positive because you say, look, it will support the economy, or you can take that as a negative, is what is PPO seeing that maybe markets are not seeing yet? How, how deep do you think the slowdown in China is, and what does it mean for, you know, exporting countries? The data is bad, and again, we've got a bunch yeah. of data points, you know, disappointing this morning, but the good news is that this is now finally coming with more policy support, you know. So what you want is bad data in China because it will probably come with more policy action, um, and, and the risk-reward around this trade is getting better because because for the, most, for the first half of the year, we had slower growth without any action by the central banks or the government. And now they seem to be quite keen to revive growth into the second half of the year. Emmanuel, thank you so much. Emmanuel Couder, head of European equity strategy at Barclays. He stays with us. And up next, we talk European equities. Coming up, we look ahead to the ECB rate decision and whether the central bank is in its home stretch of the hiking cycle. That's next. And this is Bloomberg. are facing some tough challenges. Higher living and education costs and wages that aren't keeping up with inflation are making it harder for them to support themselves. And they're relying more on the bank of mom and dad. A new bank rate report shows nearly 70% of parents with kids 18 and older are putting their own finances in danger to help them. About half are dipping into their emergency savings or delaying paying off debt, while 43% drain their retirement funds. So where do you draw the line? There seems to be a generational gap as older parents can't understand why being self-sufficient now is a lot harder than it was for them. Gen Z seems to think on average that 22 is a benchmark for covering the expenses, while baby boomers say their adult children should pay their own way closer to age 20. Either way, it's a family decision. Bankrate suggests having a conversation with your kids and setting a specific dollar amount or time frame for footing the bill. Business Week Radio, live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talking. Come on, aren't you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed yeah. does potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. Welcome back to the Open, everyone. 11 minutes into the European trading day. A bit of pressure across the board. We look at central banks. There's nothing else but central banks. I'm kidding. There is a little bit of corporate news. We have a bit of technology, and that's our big take, but it's really all about what the Fed did, the hawkish tilt. They, of course, did not hike interest rates, but what comes next? The other question that, of course, we're asking ourselves away from uh, PBOC and ECB that we're expecting later is ASOS. Now, shares are jumping 15% after some pretty good third quarter results in the last couple of quarters, though ASOS has been under pressure as well. So keep that in mind, and we'll do a longer-term chart to see the full uh, year prospects for the retailer. Now, the European Central Bank gathers in Frankfurt for its latest monetary policy decision today. Unlike the Fed yesterday, the ECB is widely expected to hike rates again. Now, for more, our European correspondent Maria Tadeo joins us from Frankfurt. So, uh, Maria, good morning. What exactly are we expecting? Is this like fine-tuning? 
Yes, in many ways, because Francine, it is widely expected, very well calibrated, that the European Central Bank will hike today again 25 basis points, and that should take, in principle, that deposit rate to 3.5 percent. Now, it comes a day after the Fed. We know they decided to hit uh, pause. The press conference, however, had a lot of nuance. Uh, the question is, will this have any implications today when it comes to the European Central Bank? I think on the monetary policy decision itself, it will not. The head of the European Central Bank has been clear. They are data dependent. They are not Fed dependent. So that points to another hike. But Francine, there is a common thread, uh, however, and it's this idea of the end game. What happens when you approach the final stage? And I'm not saying today will be the final hike. We know that July for the ECB is very much on the cards. But it's this idea of how do you fine tune and calibrate the end? And we know that when you get to that stage, the trade-offs become complicated. Maintaining that consensus in the governing council can get heated. So this press conference today, look, I think this, this is going to be an interesting one. Yeah, I wonder how many questions actually Madame Lagarde will have to field on banks, Italian and Greek banks, and the other questions, of course, what they do with the balance sheet. We also have economic projections, Maria. So what are we expecting? What are you looking out for? Yes, and they are, of course, always uh, important. But this time around, uh, you focus on two numbers. It's inflation. If you look at the expectations as of now, uh, they were hoping and expecting to see inflation 2.9% in 2024, 2.1% in 2025. Those numbers will be crucial because, again, we know that this is a central bank that wants to look at the medium target. There's a lot of seasonal factors that come in and matter, really, when you look at inflation. We know that energy has created huge distortions so they want to see the medium term impact to get that proof that the forces of monetary policy are working the other number is GDP the euro area is in a technical recession we're also getting this weird divergence between the manufacturing and the services uh, situation also in Europe and to me it'll be interesting to see whether she says uh, the economy actually it could face a lot of headwinds this is not just a one-off there are fundamental problems still uh, for Europe and of course we're seeing in the press conference Conference. One of the questions that will come up repeatedly, I presume, is what happens in July. Is it 25 basis points again and you stop or you take a breather, reassess in September? Yeah, the million dollar question, trillion dollar question. Maria, thank you so much. Maria Tadeo in Frankfurt for the ECB. Now let's get back to, of course, the ECB story, but also look at equities with Emmanuel Co, head of European equity strategy at Barclays. Emmanuel, thank you so much, first of all, for sticking around. When you look at the ECB, I don't know whether from an equity point of view, of course, we have talked about inflation and forecasts, but it's really the TLTROs and what it means for the smaller banks. Do you worry about the banking sector? We don't worry about the banking sector, but I think the ECB has to be a bit more, you know, uh, you know, open to the idea that we are now much later in the cycle, we have cracks in the economy, growth is slowing, uh, and the banking sector is still very much, you know, uh, liquidity dependent. So I think the ECB has to find a way to keep fighting inflation and, you know, hiking rate as much as they have to, but at the same time, try to disconnect and preserve the banking sector. So there are still a number of measures that ECB can put in place to mitigate the impact of TLT to uh, reimbursement by the banks. But look, I think they are really working a very fine line here. And, and, uh, and I guess, you know, their communication will probably be focused on trying to distinguish what they have to do to kind of fight inflation and how much they can do to still keep the banking sector uh, supported by liquidity. Emmanuel, uh, you, you talk about, you know, you talk about technicals being frothy, I think worldwide, or especially in, in the U.S., you look at some of the um, tentative broadening of leadership into some of the smaller caps, right, that you could tactically allocate to. What's your takeaway from Europe in general? Where do you want to be invested in right now? So, look, under the hood, there's, there's a lot of dislocation in the markets. It's a very strange bull market where a lot of things have, be, have behaved quite defensively. So what we like is... As of yesterday's China exposure, you know, we raised our exposure to China and China exposed equities like mining. So the market is up strongly and the mining is down 10% in Europe. That's almost a 20% underperformance. And we think there's a clear catalyst with China turning more supportive of growth. So bad data is good news finally uh, in China again. Um, now, small caps are down 25% from their peak level in 2021. Yes, they are more domestic dependent, more bank lending dependent, but we find them very, very cheap 
and uh, somewhat giving investors a very strong uh, growth opportunity at very cheap valuation right now. This is what cyclicals in Europe that you want to be investing in? We, we like cyclicals, but we have a barbell allocation because you know, we are late in the cycle and we need to have optionality in the portfolio. So we like staples, but you know, we also have been reallocating more to the kind of shine exposure uh, cyclicals in the last couple of days. What do you do with retail? So I know, and again, the markets have really been jumping all over the place, right? We saw a huge exposure to luxury. They did very well. Then market had, had a lot of questions about China ASOS. A lot of bad questions in the last couple of quarters, but now the share price up 15 percent. So we see that some of the names in retail might be helped because you had a bit of destocking in the last six months. They are quite advanced in the inventory cycle. And at the same time, we see some support coming back to the low-end consumer. This inflation is, is good news for the consumer. So the, uh, I would say, moderating cost of living crisis, at least on the continent, with gas prices, energy prices coming down, hence CPI coming down in the environment of a very strong labor market should come as a relief to the consumer. So, yeah, I think retail, leisure, sector that could benefit from a resilient consumer for now. Is there anything, if you look at NVIDIA, now worth like a trillion, is there anything in Europe that looks attractive because they make, I mean, I think there was like a French company that ha has been, you know, that was linked to AI, got 100 million on like the second month and doesn't produce anything. Are, are we in a tech bubble? Uh, we're in a tech frenzy, for sure. And, and we see the broader tech universe benefiting from this, you know, fear of missing out, which is forcing investors to go back and to chase some of these tech-related names. Look, we like semis, we like software, because they are the, you know, the easiest way for us to get a claim on this AI, uh, you know, interest now. Look, positioning is still not crazy, it's still not crowded on tech. People were very into tech at the start of the year. It was all about shorting duration and preparing for higher for longer rates. So what we are seeing now is people coming back to tech. But look, um, it looks a bit topish and hot, that's why we want to buy more laggards, but we still stick to an overweight on tech because earnings in our view will be supportive and we don't find positioning to be overly crowded yet. What do you do with European energy stocks? Uh, we are not in energy. I mean, what we did was to swap mine energy for miners. So we want to have some commodity exposure with Catalyst, basically with China uh, being the support. And we think China will do a bit more to support the housing market, which is one of the key drivers of the uh, mining sector in Europe. Energy is a bit more about, you know, uh, softer demand in developed market, and also in a world of disinflation, energy should be, you know, uh, basically uh, constrained. So it's cheap, it gives very good yield, and that's something that might matter for, for investors, but in terms of catalyst, with all price stuck in a range and basically uh, disinflation broadening, we don't really see, you know, energy really outperforming. Emmanuel, thank you so much for joining us today. Emmanuel Coder, Head of European Equity Strategy at Barclays. Coming up, is London losing its fizz? We speak to the chief executive of WeSoda after the company pulled plans for a $7.5 billion IPO on the LSC. That interview at 8.40 a.m. UK time, and this is Bloomberg. But the sign on the CEO's door often says, made in India. Alphabet's Sundar Pichai, Microsoft's Satya Nadella, IBM's Arvind Krishna, Micron Technologies' Sanjay Mehotra, and that's just the start. Add in the chief executives of Adobe, Deloitte, Gap, VMware. And that doesn't count Indians running companies all over the world. Why have so many Indians risen to the top? But no Kosla points to India's incredibly competitive education system. If you can survive the pressure it takes to get into one of the Indian Institutes of Technology, it gives you confidence to handle American universities and later the business world. Meanwhile, the belief in India's ability to produce so many tech wizards is reinforced every year. Indians make up about three-fourths of the immigrants receiving coveted H-1B visas for the U.S. And it's a safe bet that some of them will eventually find their way to the C-suite. to the world of business. 
Every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, hosts Anne Marie Hordern and Joe Matthew, alongside Kaylee Lines, deliver news, insight, and analysis live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. Get the latest from and about politics' biggest power players at the end of every trading day. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month. Welcome back to the open, everyone. 23 minutes into the European trading day. Uh, the picture across the board, European stocks down two tenths of 8%. The Fed, that's been gone. Hawkish tilt, but actually they paused yesterday. And now it's the turn of the ECB. Let's also get a look at the stocks on the move this morning with our Joe Easton from our equities team. And Joe, we start with retail. Absolutely, France. We're looking at retail specifically over in the fashion space. So a couple of the big names out with the earnings today. Firstly, we've got ASOS. They're reporting a return to profit even as their sales slumped around 15% in the last quarter. They're cutting costs, and that sent that stock up 12%. It was up as much as 15% earlier. That was the biggest gain in five months. Meanwhile, H&M also going. The headline was pretty negative with sales dropping, but they were basically blaming that on some cold weather in March, and actually it has improved in June. So that stock is going higher alongside ASOS. We've also brought up Inditex, the owner of Zara, and also AB Foods, of course, the owner of Primark. They're moving higher. There's a positive note out from one of the brokers, Bernstein, helping to push that whole sector up today, Fran. Um, so, Joe, overall, I mean, is there a theme? I know we look at, for example, software one. The tech theme is pretty, pretty strong. Exactly. So tech looking pretty good today. Software one, now that stock has just opened. It didn't open. I was looking at it for around 15 minutes. It's opened up 20% higher. Bain Capital, the private equity company, is coming in with a bid. Now this bid is at 18.50 francs a share. So it's gone up to 18.20, a 20% premium. However, there is drama because while the investors in terms of the founders are backing this deal, they say it's a good deal, the board has put out a separate statement this morning saying it's not a good deal, saying it undervalues the firm. This stock a couple of years ago traded at 30 Swiss francs a share, so you can see why they think it doesn't actually value the company fully. But tech pretty strong today, and Software One, the enterprise firm, the best one over in Zurich this morning. And finally, Joe, Legal and General, new chief executive. So legal in general, Fran Antonio Simoes from Portugal, he's coming in. He's joining from Santander. He also did 13 years at HSBC and worked in the UK, so has a UK connection. However, the asset management space is pretty weak all across the board today, so that stock is down 1.3%. I don't think it's really a reflection of the market's view on the new CEO. It's more a broader move. Also brought up Diageo, obviously a completely different sector. This is booze, this is spirits. Guinness, there's a note from Goldman Sachs downgrading Diageo saying that wholesalers are really downbeat on the US in terms of the spirit market at the moment, so they don't think you should be buying shares of Diageo. Diageo and Legal in general are the worst performers on the FTSE 100 today. Joe, thank you so much. Joe Easton there with some of the stocks to watch. Now, the OD, the hedge fund, of course, being in the news because of scandals in the last seven days extensively, but also this is our stories that Bloomberg has broken over the last 12 months. OD, we now understand, is in advanced talks on rehousing some of the funds to other managers. So this is just the latest after we know that the hedge fund also asked Crispin Odi uh, to leave and a new person has been appointed to be in charge. European indices focused on what the Fed has said. We're seeing a bit of pressure across the board, down two tenths of 8% as we await the ECB. Coming up, we speak to 8VC managing partner, Joe Lonsdale, who will be discussing investments in Europe at the Founders Forum event. That's next, and this is Bloomberg.
world of politics. We're not going to be relying upon countries whose values we don't share. To the world of business. It's all about corporate power in the end. Balance of Power, live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. We're going to be more excited what's in store for you. How long will it take? How many years? Why don't we take this one day at a time? Good luck. Everybody has a perspective. Every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time, join host Anne-Marie Hordern. It's the one area, really, of bipartisanship. Well, I think we're getting more of it. That's optimistic. And Joe Matthew. The debt ceiling is looming. How close are we going to get to the line before you start to worry? Alongside Kaylee Lyons. The door was open for regulators to do more. And that puts the Fed between a rock and a hard place. As they deliver news. This is such an important economic issue. He's Plus, no longer trying to run away from that. Me. Really a blue some mind. Insight. We can both invest in law enforcement and also make sure that communities feel safe in their own skin. And analysis. I think your audience will get this more than most. This is not the Republican Party that you know. It allows him to do what he did so successfully in 2020 which is run against crazy from and about politics biggest power players this was the zombie case and it's now more than well alive that's for sure uh, with two more potentially to come i'm willing to have this battle it is vitally important this is the intersection of washington and wall street bringing people directly to the decision makers right. that impact your investments and your life balance of power every weekday at 5 p.m eastern only on bloomberg your global business authority BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. to the open everyone 30 minutes into the european trading day and here are your top stories it will be appropriate to cut rates at such time as inflation is coming down really significantly and again we're talking about a couple years out i think as anyone can see not a single person on the committee wrote down a rate cut this year Fed Chair Jay Powell signals more hikes this year after the FOMC keeps rates on hold. The PBOC lowers the rate of its one-year loans, ramping up stimulus as the Chinese economy deteriorates. European stocks and U.S. futures turn lower. And finally, the ECB expected to raise rates by a quarter point later today. Markets will be watching out for the outlook from President Christine Lagarde. And of course, we're live in Frankfurt. Now, this is a picture for equities. We did see a little bit of a downturn, uh, partly because there are questions about the inflation off going forward. Maybe it's a little bit of profit taking after what we heard from the Fed, which is a hawkish tilt. But of course, they pause the markets not quite believing that they will be as hawkish as certainly uh, Jay Powell made it sound. European stocks down two tenths of eight percent. Let's also take a look at some of the sectors that are on the move. Joe uh, Easton was bringing us some of the stocks that are moving. ASOS, one of the biggest gainers in today's trading session, third quarter, extremely strong. It's up 15 percent. You retail uh, 1.2 percent higher. Basic resources, a little bit of pressure, down 1.2 percent. Maybe that's on the back of also the PBOC having to do more because of weaker data from China. So what does the future hold for tech-enabled industries and their business models? Well, that's part of the conversation at the Founders Forum, where investors, chief executives, and political leaders are meeting. Well, very own Tom McKenzie is at the event. Tom, over to you, and good morning. Francine, good morning. A very bright and sunny Founders Forum here just outside of Oxford. Very pleased to say I'm joined by Joe Lonsdale, managing partner at 8VC. They manage between 6 and 7 billion US dollars, a co-founder of Palantir, the defense and intelligence software, and quite frankly, a pretty big name in terms of the world of tech, in terms of the world of investing and entrepreneurship. Joe, thank you for joining us. Let's start with what is exciting you. What is the focus? What is your terms of appetite for opportunity. What are you looking to invest in and put your money to play in at this point? Thanks for having me, Tom. Well, it's great to be over here in London uh, with a lot of talent here. You know, obviously everyone's focusing on AI. We got an industrial revolution that could really improve society. There's lots of implications for healthcare, lots of implications for many other areas. You know, we're looking for the top technology cultures in the world working on things that are newly possible. And you're seeing stuff in defense, you're seeing stuff in, in bio, you're seeing stuff in a lot of areas these days. Talk to us about artificial intelligence and regulation. You have people like Jeffrey Hinton, of course, known as the godfather of AI, left Google so he could speak more openly about the risks he's worried about. 
military combined with AI, AI robots. That's the kind of thing that maybe Palantir would be involved in. Is he overstating the risks of this technology? You know, I really admire people like Jeffrey Hinton and, and, and what, what he achieved at Google and otherwise. I probably fall more on the side of Mark Andreessen in this debate. I think it's just extraordinary the kind of positive upside we have for society. I think we should probably think of this as another industrial revolution. In the U.S., when we had an industrial revolution from 1870 to 1900, GNP went up 233%. So basically what that means is the average person was more than three times wealthier, you know, one generation later. And I think it could be even bigger than that this time. If you think of, you know, think of having personalized AI coaches and teachers and therapists for everyone, I think there's so much kind of prosperity and well-being we create in the world with this the technology. Risks, the risks that people point to, misinformation, job displacement, even potentially AI-created humanity, global extinction. These are the risks that people are talking about. Those risks, are they real? How far off are they? And what should the guardrails be? What should the role of government be? Well, I think it's very difficult for any top-down force to decide what is real information, what is misinformation. This is a very, very hard problem. It's why the U.S. has the First Amendment. It's why the English historically have, have had free English air, where you don't actually have the government telling you what to say. So I, I, I think while you'll definitely get all sorts of misinformation, I think the positive upsides just massively Should outweigh Should the government that. have a role, though, in regulating AI? There's probably something around like purposeful libel that you shouldn't be instantly allowed to do. It's very limited. I think it needs to be very limited because I think the way these technologies work is you don't know exactly how to apply them and what they're going to look like. And just the upside of fixing healthcare, healthcare, the upside of fixing and making these industries more productive is so high for all of us. Now, I do think there's a separate question about existential threats, right? Yes. So I think so. Sam, Sam Altman's a friend. He's been talking about some of these issues. I guess I would disagree with him on having government very involved in the first part that mostly benefits big corporations who can hire armies of lawyers and set the rules for their way. I agree that, you know, imagine it's the year 2032, a GPT-12 is out, uh, you know, the AI helped design it, and, you know, there's North Korea as well as maybe some really crazy autocrats and other billionaires are trying to build their own giant supercluster GPUs which have, you know, more intelligence than the entire human race. Maybe we should be careful about, you know, who gets to have a $10 billion super cluster with super advanced AI. There definitely probably should be some thinking about that. Now, I think the whole point, though, is we have to watch this closely and we have to learn how it works. We have to be very careful not to kill it in, the, in its infancy. Elon Musk is a friend of yours. He says you should press the pause button for six months. I have a lot of respect for Elon, and, and I, I think there's some frustration with how OpenAI iterated after he funded it and it became beholden to, you know, to Microsoft and other structures maybe he wouldn't have put in place there. Um, if we pause, what happens is China keeps going, and they get way ahead, and then they get to shape the future of it, and they get to shape the future of the world more in the direction they want. And that, to me, is much worse. Europe wants to be setting the agenda in terms of regulating AI. What's their playbook looking like? Are they taking the right approach? I mean, I, I, I don't want to be too rude here, but I don't think Europe is really on the forefront right now. I think, I think America and China are, and, and I think that the most likely outcome for Europe trying to regulate it is they basically prevent the Industrial Revolution from happening in Europe, and it, it's, and it remains a place where it's very nice to take my daughters on vacation, but maybe is not part of the future of the world innovation-wise, if they're not very careful. This is the one possible upside of Brexit you could talk about, is that maybe Europe commits suicide with its regulation and stops any development there, and maybe the, the you know, UK gets it right and doesn't do so. Maybe, maybe Europe commits suicide with this regulation. That's, that's a strong line, Joe. When it comes, there's something else that's happening in Europe, a lot of spending on defense. Are you... Palantir, 8VC, are you getting involved? Are you involved in Ukraine? Are you involved in NATO in terms of defense contracts? What's that looking like? Yeah, and, and, and the Europe situation is not just coming from me, by the way. I have a lot of friends who are leaders in the European industry who are trying to write to the regulators and prevent them from doing this. This is a, a big deal Europe's working on right now. Now, on the defense side, uh, you know, it's very heartening to see people finally agree with some of the defense stuff. You know, obviously, as a founder of Palantir, I've been involved in this for a long time. We started a few new defense companies. We started Epris five or six years ago, a global leader in electronic warfare. A lot of people thought it was like very strange to be doing defense five or six years ago. Now they all want to invest in help, which is wonderful. I, I hope that there's kind of a long-term responsibility where the Europeans, you know, get their spend up to levels they agreed with NATO and, and kind of pull their own weight, which you haven't seen them doing for 20 years. So it's very promising they're starting to do it now. Is it a temporary flash in the pan where they're temporarily afraid because of Ukraine, or do they maintain that responsibility? That's, that's still a very open question for defense companies you might want to build here. 2024, we're looking ahead to the elections, U.S. elections. You're so, supporting Ron DeSantis. Are you backing him financially, Joe? Yes, I'm a supporter of Ron DeSantis. I apologize to the world for the reality show going on in America. It's quite embarrassing uh, with all of this. I uh, Listen, I, I, 
I, I thought a lot of what the Trump administration did was, was very positive. I'm very good friends with people who are in that administration. I think the man himself has become even more of an embarrassment in the last couple of years. And I think Ron is, is, he a bust, is Trump a busted flush? I don't know if he's a busted flush, but he's, he's, uh, he, he, does, he does seem to be not as strong as he was even a few years ago. And, and it's very concerning a lot of the things he did. I think the only real alternative on the other right to him right now is DeSantis. And, and to be clear, you're putting your money, are you, are you fundraising, are you putting some money towards his, his campaign, Ron DeSantis' so, campaign? So I, I, as, as you know, I have a policy group, Cicero, that's very active in 12 states. We work with a lot of governors. DeSantis has been one of the most competent people we've ever worked with. He's very into the details. He'll get all the policies. He'll read it himself. He'll learn and have very advanced questions, extremely mm -hmm. bright guy. When there's a crisis, he'll show up and fix things. I mean, that kind of competence, we, we need someone in our generation who's competent in charge. So you're putting your money behind him? Yes. Should, very quick last one, Elon Musk is a friend. Should he run for office at some point? Well, I don't believe he's allowed to become president uh, because he was not born mm -hmm. in the U.S. based on how our Constitution works. Elon is extremely competent. I think that whoever's president should be bringing him to the White House and getting his advice on a number of issues. And I think it's a huge mistake that President Biden's not doing that. I hope whoever wins on the left or right should be getting advice from people like him. Joe Lonsdale, thank you very much. Indeed, managing partner of AVC, of course, on that. Backing for Ron DeSantis and the potential regulatory suicide that Europe might be committing when it comes to artificial intelligence. Francine. Yeah, not uncontroversial. Tom, thank you so much for a great interview. Tom McKenzie, Founders Forum event in Oxford. Coming up later, more from Founders Forum. We'll be speaking to Stability AI Chief Executive Emad Mostak. Then we look at markets yen extending its drop against the dollar as traders are preparing for the BOJ. Remember, that's tomorrow. And then a little bit later on, we also uh, talk with a company that decided not to list in London. So is London losing its fizz? We speak with the chief executive of WeSoda after the company pulls its plan for a $7.5 billion IPO on the LSE. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Okay, so you're moving in on me quick, distracting oh, yeah. me with your fancy hands. <laughs> I'm going to deal with your knight because he's really bothering me. Ah, my knights. Yeah, he's a troublemaker. Yeah. What did you get up to this weekend? Uh, you know, just robot stuff. A lot of chess. I was practicing for uh, for you. I know you're pretty good. Ooh, I don't like that. I will take this. Uh, put it over here. Not cool. Not cool. All right. I will. I will concede. I can see. Ah. You got me beat. <laughs> Very good game. Well played. Thank you, sir. Thank you. covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services, and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg, your global business authority.
The top names in business are on Bloomberg. The energy in Shanghai was like New York on crack. Things are going to get worse in the economy at the same time as you have this internal conflict. We need more bipartisan conversations because this is an American issue. Are some of these assets commodities or are they securities? And we've been asking the SEC for a long time. But I think there's more problems under the surface. It's incredibly exciting, as important as the birth of the Internet. Nobody covers business like Bloomberg, your global business authority. Welcome back to the open, everyone. 43 minutes into the European trading day. A little bit of pressure. Look, across the board, stocks retreating on the back of some pretty weak economic data from China. We did see support from PBOC on what they are trying to do with the economy. And then, of course, traders looking forward to the ECB later and looking back at the Fed yesterday with this hawkish tilt, although they did not raise rates. Now, on to a corporate story, a big corporate story. The world's largest producer of natural soda ash, We Soda, has pulled its London IPO just two weeks after announcing it. Now, the company cited what it called extreme investor caution in the British capital for its decision. Well, I am very pleased to welcome to the chief, to the chief executive of WeSoda, Alistair Warren, to the program. Alistair, thank you so much. We're so happy we could make this interview work. This is huge news. Why did you pull the IPO? Uh, look, the, the good news about our IPO was we attracted a very broad range of investor interest. The, the bad news and the reason we ultimately pulled the IPO was because whilst we were prepared to accept, you know, the normal valuation discount that you get at IPOs. The, where investors got to was such an extreme position that we just took a view that the valuation just didn't make sense for us. And given that we didn't need the money, we decided to um, pull the IPO. If you had decided to list elsewhere, do you think the IPO would have gone ahead? I think within the European markets at large, I don't think it would have made a difference. I don't think this is a London versus Paris versus Amsterdam issue. I think it's an interesting debate as to whether the U.S. would be, have been more supportive, but that makes no sense for our business today. Um, so, so I think within the context of Europe, it would have probably ended up with a broadly similar outcome. But, but had you tried to list it in New York, you think you would have had a, a better chance of going through it? Had your business model permitted it because of what? Is it capital flows? Is it investors? I, yeah, look, I think ultimately the, the issue in, in Europe is that there's a very high level of caution because, frankly, the IPO market has been closed for such a long time. Obviously, there's been one or two and some notably uh, sort of big name uh, IPOs that have, that have got done, but generally it's been closed. And I, I think that, you know, today uh, there's just such a level of caution, such a, a fear uh, of what will happen in the aftermarket that people just drive ever lower values. And what you really need is, is a group of investors that are prepared to look at a company on its strengths, its fundamentals, and have the conviction to step forward. But, Azra, why do you think, that, you know, the IPO market has been closed? Again, is it that investors are nervous? Is it regulation? Like, what are some of the, the things that you worry about? I mean, Which leads also to the future, frankly, of this continent. I, yeah, look, I, I, think, I think that people point to regulation, but I don't think that's the major issue. Um, and people are trying to point the finger at London versus Europe. I don't think that's the issue in, in Brexit. I, I do think that one of the challenges we have today is that on the buy side, there seems to be uh, very few investors that are prepared to look at things on their fundamentals and identify the differences. People like shorthand ways of coming to valuation conclusions. And sometimes with companies like ours, as an example, uh, you've got to look at those fundamentals before you can reach a value conclusion. But is that different in the US? I, I think it does seem to be a little bit different. Um, you know, obviously, you've got a far broader pool of investors, for starters. Uh, and I think people tend to have higher levels of conviction to back themselves, yeah. uh, as opposed to following others. Again, is this a little bit of a blip because of COVID, because of, you know, Ukraine and, and maybe investor, longer term, I guess, investor appetite to be in Europe? Or do you think this is a structural no, look, problem? No, I don't think, look, there's no doubt that, so, so when IPOs work, they all yeah. work. And when when the IPO market closed, it's very difficult to get anything to work. And I think we're an example of that. You know, what better company than something with strong cash flow, asset backed, huge margins, global leader, sustainability? You'd think that would work, but it didn't. Alistair, do, do you regret starting the process? No, not at all. I mean, I think that, you know, we always describe this as a step in a, a long term journey. Um, of course, we'd have liked to have got there. A large number of people have done an enormous amount of work to, to get us to this place. And of course, we wanted to succeed. but. 
we didn't need the money, and we'll now go back to business and carry on with our growth projects and our commercial uh, initiatives and, and drive the business forward. So the longer-term plan is what, get bigger in the U.S.? Yeah, so, the, exactly. You know, what are the narratives, actually, that help you make a better U.S. business and then to list in the U.S., possibly? What's driving us to the U.S. is access to resource. So 90% of the world's Trona resource that we yeah. produce soda ash from is located in the U.S. In the US. And so, uh, you know, we're going to grow more than double uh, over the next five, six years. And most of that growth is in the U.S. for precisely that reason. But once you've got a big U.S. business, then it opens other options in terms of listing venue. What, what would be your ideal listing venue in the U.S.? I think, look, we, we haven't given this a lot of thought, but logically you'd be in New York, uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. And, you know, I think that uh, over time that will become a, a, a more viable option uh, for us. But I'm not saying that we, we wouldn't consider listing here again. But for now... It's back to business as usual. Um, what are some of the pitfalls or some of the worries that you have in the U.S.? I don't know if, if you have any, but, you know, at the moment it could be the economy, it could also be politics, you know, a quite divided country. Yeah, but, but again, you know, ours is a global business, right? Yeah. Uh, so we sell in 80 countries around the world. So whilst we'll be producing there, uh, you know, more than 80% of what we produce will be exported. And it will be exported to largely the growth economies of the world because that's the people, you know, that are really consuming more and more soda ash. But you could have, and we don't know because we're in an election cycle, and I know everyone's, you know, freaking out trying to figure out what it means for policy. But you, you could see, and I don't know if, if it's something in, in your modeling, you know, tariffs going up and actually the U.S. becoming more insular. You could, but think about it like this. Soda ash is one of the few uh, industrial commodities where... The, the U.S. has the whip hand over China. So China's the single biggest consumer, and the U.S. has the single largest resource base. And so I think that it will be a kind of shooting themselves in the foot if they were to do something that would prohibit them from taking advantage of that position. So do you feel like you're in the middle of geopolitics? No, not do you really. Ha do you have to spend a lot of time try no. trying to lobby governors in the U.S.? Not really. We, we, uh, to be fair, soda ash is, whilst it's the 10th most consumed industrial ingredient, it's amazingly sits below the radar screen uh, for most people. And I think actually before we contemplated our IPO, most people had never heard of it. Yeah, but, but how, you know, how can you stay below the radar for long? Because <laughs> it's well, a lucrative company. I mean, it's a big it, business. It, it is, but at the end of the day... You know, the lot, I mean, first of all, you can't produce, as an example, glass without soda rush. The world can't survive without glass. So what are we going to do? They're going to suddenly put barriers to prevent that from happening? I just don't think that's logical. You know, of course, it can speak to pricing, but I think that will agree to our advantage. All right, Alistair, thank you so much for joining us today. We had a wonderful conversation with the We Soda Chief Executive Alistair Warren joining us this morning. Now, coming up, the mega week for central banks rolls on with the ECB and the Bank of Japan set to deliver rate decisions. We discuss that next, and this is Bloomberg. And I think we've moved from this attitude from it's an indulgence, a waste of time, almost an illness that needs a cure. For something as universally important to human life as sleep, mysteries surrounding its necessity and utility have only just been recently uncovered. Some of our biggest discoveries were in the 1970s or 1980s. And so it makes it a really exciting field because it seems as though we're uncovering new insights each and every day. Some scientists are going further to find out how sleep and what happens there can be harnessed to further expand our understanding. It's easy to memorize things. That makes you smart if you can 
spit back a lot of facts. But if you want to be wise, if you really want wisdom, you got to know when and how and why to use that information. And that's what your brain figures out while you're sleeping. In a multi-trillion dollar industry, there's a lot of ground to cover. We indeed have a rally. We're talking a lot of dividends. We're talking income. We'll show you what's happening in ETFs like no one else. Bloomberg ETF IQ, Monday on Bloomberg. The mega week for central banks rolls on with the ECB and the Bank of Japan set to deliver their rate decisions. Now joining us is Noor Ali from our MLive team. Noor, it's exciting. I mean, there's quite a lot going on with central banks, but then we have, you know, encouraging news from the Fed, not so from PBOC. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in that divergence, you'll see that the ECB today is going to give us a bit of a unified voice and perhaps some anticipated calm. We know exactly what the ECB is going to do because that's exactly what they've been telling us that they're going to do. And the markets are completely bought on that. 25 basis points expected across the board. It's been a unanimous message across all ECB policymakers. And I think the messaging here is going to be, will we get another one in July? Now, I know that a lot of people are thinking, yes, absolutely, the ECB has said that. But we're about 70% sure in terms of market pricing whether or not we're going to get a July and then a big pause and then come back in September. So we'll see whether that debate continues to shift or we'll get more question of whether or not potentially there is room for a pause sooner than expected. And this is all dependent on data, right? What does inflation, if you look at modeling, which frankly most people got wrong, it went up very significantly, it's now coming down. Does it come now down, to, you know, enough for central banks to be comfortable with it? That's a big question, right? Because you, uh, first of all, the Fed came out yesterday and said, well, you know, we're going to be data dependent, but they didn't really give us the data that we want. They're a lot less, a lot more flexible in terms of what they're looking at. So we're not really sure what is the, the right equation for central banks. What it is, though, the case for Europe in particular, you're seeing tightening credit conditions. You know, we are in restricted territory for monetary policy. I know some central bankers in Europe, especially, you know, the, the German and the Austrians, don't think so and think we're still a ways from there. But there are still, and, and inflation has pointed, you know, surprise to the downside last time, or at least in the May print. So we are, you know, there's a lot of supportive uh, data out there that shows perhaps there is more space Space for a pause if the ECB wills it, or maybe there is room for just a couple more hikes to make sure that we, we've got inflation in the bag. So we have ECB today and then BOJ tomorrow. Could the BOJ surprise? You know, that's a big unknown, right? We've had reporting last week based according on people familiar that we're not going to abandon the yield curve. The BOJ is going to pretty much stay in line with what they've done. You know, the new central bank governor is still adjusting to his new post. You know, Japan has been talking about, you know, becoming a lot more accommodative in terms of the budget, you know, supporting the government. But to be honest, we're not pricing for that in the market. So there's definitely room for an upside surprise. I don't know if we're going to see that, though. And I think the yen can definitely show that. You know, trading at 139, around 140, we're going to potentially continue in that work. However, if there's a surprise, then obviously we're not prepared for that from a market's yeah. perspective. All, all bets are off, Nora. Thank you so much, Nora Al Ali. In fact, as Nora was talking about the BOJ, yen extending its drop against the dollar, as of course a lot of traders are preparing for the BOJ tomorrow. Now, coming up, we'll have plenty more on the markets. That's it for the European Market Open Surveillance Early Edition is up next. Stocks for the moment retreating sentiment, a little bit subdued by the Federal Reserve's hawkish tone. Also, we had weak economic data from China weighing on a lot of the resource companies. More on the markets next, and this is Bloomberg.
you think New York is as safe as it was when you were in the government? It's not as safe as it was. Crime is clearly rising. I mean, it's not back to the dark old days of, you know, pre-Giuliani in the early 90s. But we got to be careful because safety is the foundation of everything. And so I know the current mayor is committed to reducing crime, um, but we're going to have to be incredibly aggressive in making sure that crime does not increase. Are you involved any longer in New York City matters or your advisor? Yeah, the City? mayor and governor actually asked me to co-chair a panel or a task force on reviving the commercial districts throughout the city. So I've been in the middle of that. global economy is changing as the world recalibrates. After decades of stagnation, Japan's leaders are forging a more innovative and sustainable path forward to revitalize the nation. Corporate giants, policymakers, and pioneers tell us how they're doing just that. Every week on Japan Ahead, right here on Bloomberg Television. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, trying to open... This is Bloomberg Technology. And welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. everyone and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. It will be appropriate to cut rates at such time as inflation is coming down really significantly. And again, we're talking about a couple years out. I think, as anyone can see, not a single person on the committee wrote down a rate cut this year. Fed Chair Jay Powell signals more hikes this year after the FOMC keeps rates on hold. The PBOC lowers the rate of its one-year loans, ramping up stimulus as the Chinese economy deteriorates. And Europe's ECB is expected to tighten by a quarter point, and we're live in Frankfurt. Plus, a blow for the UK as the world's largest producer of natural soda ash cancels its proposed London IPO. We'll ask what it means for Britain as an investment destination. Now, good morning, everyone. Let's check on the markets. A lot going on in the markets because it's all about central banks. Now, stocks were up. Now they're down. Uh, they're definitely retreating today. Sentiment a little bit subdued by the Federal Reserve's hawkish tone and also weak economic data from China weighing on resource companies. So on the upside, we have, for example, uh, the retail stocks, certainly here in the UK, ASOS, gaining some 13 percent. And then it's really basic resources that are down the most. Now, the US central bank, a lot of people would argue has quashed enthusiasm in the markets about the potential imminent for rate cuts. Investors about to get an update, of course, on how resolute the ECB is in its campaign against rising prices. So we all know it. It's a big week for central banks. The Fed paused the rate hike but projected borrowing costs to go higher than expected. Following on from the Fed, as we know, the ECB rate decision comes today at 1.15 UK time. So joining us now is Rebecca Chesworth, ETF strategist at State Street Global Advisors and Bloomberg Opinions' Marcus Ashworth. So thank you both for joining us. We're going to have a robust conversation on central banks and inflation. Rebecca, I mean, there's something that the Fed keeps on saying, and there's something that Jay Powell keeps on saying, but the market hears something else. Who's right? How hawkish was his message yesterday? Yes, it's very interesting because immediately we saw that dot plot change. We're expecting two more rate rises if you believe the Fed, and yet the market is still not pricing that in. And that's been the case all the way along. Now, it, that's not surprising because even if you listen to what the Fed is trying to juggle, they're trying to juggle inflation that's sticky, jobs uh, which are very, very strong. And yet, at the same time, you have to think what is happening to those companies that are feeling that increased pressure. What's happening with the rate pressure we've already seen? Yeah. What's happening with the tightening? We've already seen one crack with the regional banks. What's more to come? So yeah. I'm not surprised there's a disconnect. But in the background, there's still a lot to discuss. And yeah. 
what we see, and I'm sure we'll come on to talk about it, is it leaves investors very confused. Uh, we will, and actually markets are a little bit all over the place, Marcus. I mean, there's this belief, right, that, that the Fed is going to go gently, gently. Uh, yeah, because it probably will have to. Um, and I think it's very interesting the tone that Powell said. So everyone's taking the hawkish element of it. That's just the Fed buying optionality. And as Rebecca's saying, this summary of economic projections, it's, I wouldn't say it's gibberish, but it's, it, it's, it's a horoscope. And they've improved incorrect for many, many times in recent months. No one really pays much attention to it. It's just what the Fed's trying to retain the optionality for next month that they can hike if they want to. But it's a, a coin toss. But they want to keep it a coin toss and not have the market as it wants to, which is price out further yeah. Fed rate hikes. I think the Fed's on pause. Interesting point from Powell was about the labor market. He's now pointing it as, as a potential support for the economy, yeah. as in positive economic growth, and not necessarily the main driver of inflation. That can be really, really important, because too much of the central bank chat these days is about labor market wage rises but they're looking at the wrong thing and it's lagging. Okay, I actually also have a great morning must read from John Authors, and then we have a market terminal rate trailing the feds with Valerie Titel. So Valerie, what charts are you looking at? Look, this chart aligns very much with what the two guests have just said, that the market was really doubting the message that was in those dots and left us confused at best. So yes, there were two more hikes in that dot plot, but the market terminal rate didn't really budge that much higher. It's at 5.3%, roughly where it was before, uh, before the Fed met. It was all about that lack of urgency and that ambivalence over whether that the Fed is actually going to use these hikes that made the market really question if they're going to raise rates to 5 and three quarters. It almost seems like the Fed is just going to have them in their back pocket if they need to use them, but the market is telling us they don't think so. Yeah, so if you look, Marcus, at, you know, that chart, what you're saying, what should they be looking at? <laughs> well, I mean, I think the market's trying to tell us on forward inflation, uh, the inverted yield curve, and a raft of other measures. They don't believe the Fed has much traction, uh, and the Fed wants, and has done a, actually a magnificent job in, in keeping the market away from pricing and rate cuts. I think that's the important point. They do not want any rate cut pricing in for at least the next year. And that, yeah. you have to say, they're an unsuccessful job at. Um, I have my morning must read, Rebecca, which is from John Authors. I mean, he's almost as brilliant as Marcus, but he, he, is, he is really brilliant. And basically, he asks a very simple question. I think we have the quote board, which will get up. Is like, if they're so hawkish, then why just not raise rates yesterday? Yes. Well, I think that, that I think you've put it right with the, the optionality because that's what they're putting there, because they do not know. Let's be very honest. Yes, exactly. They do not know. There are too many things. And, and, of course, they have that dual mandate as well. So it's a little bit more complicated than some of the other central banks. So it really is a difficult position for them. And, and, and you know, we could go on discussing that all days, but, of course, they're not all hawks on, on, on the committee. There are, of course, doubts, so they're having to listen to both sides of the argument. I mean, I, they don't really know, but we also had a banking crisis. Like, what are they weighing up? At the end of the day, do they worry more about inflation than, than a recession? What they shouldn't do is that they, they've got a handle on inflation. You can conclude to say the Fed are in a much better position. I think they've handled the crisis better than the European central banks, uh, and I mean that quite strongly. I'm not saying they've been brilliant, and a lot of my American chums will say to me, what on earth are you talking about? The Fed's disastrous and X, Y, and Z. But they've got a much better situation, and they're handling it fairly well. They're buying themselves time. They don't exactly as well because they, don't, they have no more clue on what's going on than we do. And that's because everything is very uncertain at the moment. It could break either way. But clearly there are signs that the recession is pending and getting ever closer. And if they go over aggressive on interest rates, they will cause one and get blamed for it. So they're just buying themselves time until that point. OK, do we care about the dot plot? Yes or no? Rebecca? Absolutely. Absolutely yes. Absolutely not. Absolutely not, <laughs> Rebecca. Absolutely I think we, yes. we, we enjoy them for a starting point as something to compare and contrast. <laughs> I quite like, what are you surprised the most actually about the U.S. economy? And you look at equities, I mean, equities have been pretty strong. We keep on having these warning signals, but then if you look at, you know, business, they, they, are, they seem to be fine. They seem to be fine, and we're, we, we continue to be surprised with those economic figures. Although, you know, you can go on to the argument that it has still been a very, it's broadening out, but it has been a very, very narrow market up till now. Yeah, where, I mean, I don't understand what we're not looking at. So, so many people are Corporate ready profits. for a recession. How is it possible, Marcus, that we get from zero, like 1% to 5% and nothing breaks in the U.S. economy? Because there's so much stimulus put in. That's what people are failing to understand. It's this lagged effect we're still seeing through. Central banks are looking in the rearview mirror without failing to simply appreciate the simple fact they chucked so much money at, both in the fiscal sense, which they continue to do in the States, and in monetary stimulus, that is still feeding through. 
but, but that means that inflation at some point will get stuck. It's not going to go back down on its own. It may do, it may not. They have absolutely no idea. And, and, and the labor market stats aren't going to help them on that either. So they're starting to realize that. I think the Fed's feeling its way fairly carefully. They're the first central bank to pause. They're the ones that everyone looks to. They're the mothership. And the rest of them are just waiting. And if the Fed pauses again in July, I think you'll see the ECB and other, other ones follow. Rebecca, what does it mean for equities? What does it mean for equities? Well, I think we, I, we saw the initial reaction last night. US equities coming off after being slightly up on the day, came off and then went up. I, I think that's... That's the question. I think it makes them a bit more volatile. We've got unbelievable... You talk about unbelievable strength. I talk about un unbelievably low volatility, mm. unbelievably no. low VIX. I think it needs to make them more volatile because we cannot predict the future as we used to be able to. So I think it makes us less certain about um, volatility. Um, and also then if I reflect what the client's doing, the cl client is very broad. The investor is very broad. They're not wanting to take risks. They're not wanting to choose one sector over another at the moment, one factor over another. Marcus, do you believe that? I mean, we had these amazing stories yesterday about Taylor Swift and Beyonce changing the occupancy rates in hotels. Did you read that story? I mean, it was Sweden, extraordinary yeah. in Sweden. Like, are, are we blaming it? On, do you go long on Beyonce now? <laughs> uh, well, I've never quite understood what, what the, the phenomenon there. But, yeah, I just think that shows you that there is plenty of money out there mm -hmm. and people are prepared to spend still. Yeah. Uh, and that's partly, you know, reflected through the equity outlook. It's because corporate profits have been so strong. They've yeah. been able to maintain margins. And because that, I think that's confused everyone because it's almost like we start a new cycle. We never really completed the downdraft of the last one. So that may mean that if you do get a recession, which I don't expect, yeah. it could be much more savage. All right, Marcus and Rebecca, thank you both. You both stay with us because we have the ECB next, and maybe we'll put in a couple of dancing celebrities as well. Coming up with the 25 basis point rate rise expected at today's meeting, the focus will be on when the ECB's hiking cycle ends. We're live in Frankfurt next with all of the details. This is Bloomberg. are facing some tough challenges. Higher living and education costs and wages that aren't keeping up with inflation are making it harder for them to support themselves. And they're relying more on the bank of mom and dad. A new bank rate report shows nearly 70% of parents with kids 18 and older are putting their own finances in danger to help them. About half are dipping into their emergency savings or delaying paying off debt, while 43% drain their retirement funds. So where do you draw the line? There seems to be a generational gap as older parents can't understand why being self-sufficient now is a lot harder than it was for them. Gen Z seems to think on average that 22 is a benchmark for covering the expenses, while baby boomers say their adult children should pay their own way closer to age 20. Either way, it's a family decision. Bank rates suggest having a conversation with your kids and setting a specific dollar amount or time frame for footing the bill. ask me all the time, what is the key to being a really good investor? And I tell them it's to surround yourself with and work with the best investors you can find. On Bloomberg Wealth, I'm going to take you to meet the greatest investors in the world, the people that I would like to have managing my money. Today, I would say perhaps only second to AI right now, which is AI has got so much going on that folks are so excited about it. Climate tech is the hottest area to, to be in. In a multi-trillion dollar industry, there's a lot of ground to cover. We indeed have a rally. We're talking a lot of dividends. We're talking income. We'll show you what's happening in ETFs like no one else. Bloomberg ETF IQ, Monday on Bloomberg. When U.S. jobs numbers are released, Bloomberg brings you crucial data at terminal speed and instant expert analysis. Nobody covers jobs day like Bloomberg. sort of overdoing it and under, underdoing it are, are, are getting closer to being in balance. I still think, and my, my colleagues agree, that, that the risks to, to inflation are to the upside still. 
Fed Chair Jay Powell there. Now we're back with Rebecca Chesworth, ETF strategist at State Street Global Advisors and Bloomberg Opinions, Marcus Ashworth. Now we talk actually about uh, the ECB. There's quite a lot going on. I think our Maria Tadeo is on the ground in Frankfurt. Maria, I don't know if Maria joins us now or joins us a little bit later. Otherwise, we'll talk, of course, about the ECB and the fact that uh, the ECB and the European economy is in a little bit of a sweet spot, um, Marcus, right now. I don't know whether uh, rate setting is easier than it is certainly in Japan. You look perplexed. Europe's in a sweet spot. Better. It's in, it's in well, recession. Well, it's in recession, but the ECB has been a lot clearer, right, in what it's trying to do. We'll keep on raising rates and create a bigger recession. I, I mean, the point for me <laughs> okay, is Okay, what do you do if you're Christine Lagarde today? You, you buy yourself some optionality, just as we were saying about the, the, the Fed. The Fed have bought themselves this skipping game, yeah. uh, time for the ECB to join in. Uh, in the context, at least they give themselves the chance that if next month, the day before is the Fed meeting, before the ECB meeting, they can go and say, look, the Fed have paused twice. Yeah. If that was to happen, then they, they should perhaps, I think, also pause across the rest of summer and just move to quarterly rate decisions. Yeah. Which they used to always do on their on their policy reviews. The next one would be in September. Yeah. But I don't think she will. I don't think she can. A bit like we've seen with Fed Power. She's got to talk tough, keep on talking tough, and all the rest of it. But maybe in July, then they can buy themselves a little bit of freedom because the money supply is collapsing. Yeah. Bank lending has collapsed yeah. in all senses yeah. uh, in Europe. They're but, in recession. But will you concede to me that it's an easier decision, given everything that's going on from the ECB than elsewhere? Well, the decision is nailed on. Yeah, they yeah. are going to hike rates it's by 25 and try and claim they'll do it again. But, yeah, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> He's always so downbeat on, on, on Europe, Rebecca. But I, mean, I agree in that it is more... Di I think it's really difficult for Europe. I wouldn't call it a sweet spot, because not only have you got to follow the Fed... Yeah. But you've actually got all of those other countries, all of those other economies, all the other uh, import-export dynamics, job markets to consider. I, I think it's very difficult, to, and I agree with you. If you can buy some optionality, you've got yeah. to do the rate hike today. But thereafter, if you can hint at a pause. Yeah, so markets are positioning for a 25 basis point increase. There's little risk, of course, that the ECB could disappoint, I guess, today. Marcus probably disagrees, but we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> Maria, you're in Frankfurt following the decision for us. So a hike, done deal, and then what happens next? Yes, Francine, I'm, I'm here. I'm here in, in Frankfurt. In fact, we're inside uh, the ECB, and somewhere here you have uh, Madame Lagarde already with the rest of the governing council uh, said to make this decision, which is not a surprise. Of course, we know uh, that they will hike 25 basis points uh, today. But again, one of the significance uh, to me uh, from this meeting is that it will really kick off now this debate about the end game and what it means. And what is fascinating about this meeting, some may say it's boring, we know already what's going to happen. The projections, of course, they matter. But we've seen more or less where they see inflation uh, going. GDP, we know, yes, the euro area is in a recession. Although some parts of the economy are still doing well, is this idea of the debate about how do you approach that end game? And what we know from experience is that this is a time where the trade-offs become complicated. The meetings, closed doors from the governing council, they can get heated. You have to get economies that work differently. You have to get to a consensus that is not easy at times and that is often the difficulty for the central bank is a single mandate central bank but the dynamics and you know this francine are so different the north the south the bias that some uh, carry the implications in so many ways and on top of that you have this very strange divergence that's going on between the services and the manufacturing your service economy that is great news for you but your germany this is a real headache the energy situation is still complicated so this this calibration of the end and when they get to a point where they can confidently say this is the right policy it makes and inflation will come down that will be really one to watch so for me this meeting there's a lot more than meets the eye and frankly I'm looking forward to this press conference yeah I'm looking forward to it too I wonder how many I mean then there's TLTROs and of course what this means for the banks especially some of the weaker smaller banks in Greece and Italy Maria thank you so much for joining us from Frankfurt so if we look at the end game it, it, you could argue Marcus that markets are really ill-prepared for the ECB raising rates much higher than 3.75 percent will they have to go higher than 3.75 they may have to and that's their decision if they if they, if they genuinely think there is actual proper uh, strength coming through I mean I know the German finance ministries not being very optimistic about the start to their second yeah. quarter. We know Germany's already in recession, so not much good news coming from that point of view. But inflation is turning down. That is the good news here. You can see that yeah. in, in core particularly. So that there is some reason to say that they are running the risk of, of a credit crunch with, the, as you mentioned, Teltro's running off. 
Um, there's a, a lot of other factors that are upping quantitative tightening, um, and they'll continue to do that. I think they should maybe shift from raising just rates to maybe looking at doing more on, the, on, on QT and less on rates to shift the balance yeah. around. But that's probably for September, I reckon. Uh, uh, Rebecca, very quickly, if we have these updated quarterly projections for inflation and growth, could they be you know, the catalyst for higher interest rates for longer? Well, they could be, because I, I would say, you know, going into that meeting, a lot of people are expecting three more rate rises. But then the question is not the terminal rate, it's then how long we stay at that rate, because that's terribly important as well. And I'd say the one thing that we haven't talked about today, but we need to watch, is the European banks. So far, so good. We've had a very positive experience in Europe with our banks, unlike the US regional banks, but we really do need to consider how much more pressure we can put them under. So that's something to watch. All right, Rebecca, thank you so much. Rebecca Chesworth, ETF strategist at State Street Global Advisors and Bloomberg Opinions, Marcus Ashworth. Coming up, OD's asset management fund faces major uncertainty. We'll have the latest fallout from the fund manager's sexual assault allegations. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. It's been volatile. From bank crisis anxiety to AI exuberance, Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow chat with the biggest names about the latest tech trends. Is AI going to dominate the earnings narrative for, for this sector this week? I think we're seeing opportunity and potential platform shift that we haven't seen in a long time. If you're a company today and you're not embracing the changes that are taking place with AI, you're going to be behind. How do you prove to the investor base that you haven't just tacked on AI to make yourself sexy? It's very hard to differentiate if you're not experienced with AI. The startup stories. We think this is a watershed moment for technology. Certain categories are more exciting than others. Right now, obviously, generative AI is a category that is very exciting to startup founders, customers, and venture capitalists as well. So what we are seeing is a new area of opportunities for new founders to come and change the industries that matter. And the real talk on realistic valuations. Some of the best opportunities are, are sitting right in front of us. How do you discern which ones are good on the marketplace right now? I think founders have woken up to the reality that taking on more money at higher terms doesn't necessarily play to their benefit in the long run. How do you actually invest? Follow the VC money on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West, only on Bloomberg Television. Our studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts have the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch. Plus, the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West. Only on Bloomberg Television, your global business authority. Countdown in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real time numbers, real time analysis. Weekdays. Business Week Radio. Live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talking. Come on, aren't you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed does yeah. potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. Finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, OD Asset Management is in discussions to rehouse funds and transfer certain fund management activities to other asset managers, according to a letter to investors from the firm seen by Bloomberg News. Now, the fund has been struggling after sexual assault allegations emerging against the founder, Crispin Odi, last week. He denies wrongdoing. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by our hedge fund czar, Bloomberg's Nishant Kumar, who's been covering the story. So, Nishant, explain to us the chain of events with Crispin Odi and his firm. 
It's it's really been a dramatic chain of events at ODS asset management over the past one week. I haven't seen anything like this unfold uh, in seven years of covering hedge funds for Bloomberg. I mean, it's really as dramatic as Crispin Odie's ups and downs in performance, really, which he has seen over the last five, six years. It all started with fresh allegations of uh, sexual assault against uh, Mr. Odie. And following that, the firm has removed him from partnership, given his funds uh, to other managers to manage. Banks have cut ties. Clients have deserted. One fund is closed, two other funds have been suspended because of this wall of redemptions uh, that they are facing. Politicians are asking questions uh, from the regulator on what they have really done over the past five years. And stunningly today, the firm has now announced that it's looking for a new home for its funds and managers. So Nishant, what's the future of OD asset management? It's, again, it's, it's getting very uh, clear that the firm cannot possibly survive in its current shape or form, uh, what it was like a week back. What's really interesting here to note is that it took a sexual assault lawsuit uh, that Mr. Odie won, and at least four investigative me media stories into his alleged treatment of women over the past 25 years, including the letters by the Financial Times, for his colleagues, service providers, his clients to say enough is enough. Uh, it's clear to, to me, at least, that the firm is now struggling to survive in its current shape and form. Uh, Nishant, I mean, does it have, I don't know whether, you know, it changes the behavior of banks or, of course, some of the people that have interacted with them. Is it too soon to say whether they should have acted quicker? Because th there were media reports, including Bloomberg reports. Yeah, I mean, that's what, I mean, it has taken, It's it sounds a bit like a virtue signaling. Uh, you know, they can no longer uh, continue doing business with them. But, like, there have been enough, uh, evidences like this over the past uh, two years. It's its really shocking, and, and uh, I fail to understand what is new this time. Why they, nobody acted uh, before this? What is the catalyst? I think we are living in a different world where these things are getting very, very difficult uh, to manage and to ignore. Nishan, thank you so much. Nishan Kumar there with the very latest on Crispin OD. Now, coming up, the UK's appeal as an investment destination, Resoda's decision not to list in London dashes hopes of recovering from an IPO drought. So we'll have plenty more on that shortly. And this is Bloomberg. on the product may read made in the USA, but the sign on the CEO's door often says made in India. Alphabet's Sundar Pichai, Microsoft's Satya Nadella, IBM's Arvind Krishna, Micron Technologies' Sanjay Mehotra, and that's just the start. Add in the chief executives of Adobe, Deloitte, Gap, VMware, and that doesn't count Indians running companies all over the world. Why have so many Indians risen to the top? But no Kosla points to India's incredibly competitive education Connection system. Lost. If you can survive the pressure it takes to get into one of the Indian institutes of technology, it gives you confidence to handle American universities and later the business world. Meanwhile, the belief in India's ability to produce so many tech wizards is reinforced every year. Indians make up about three-fourths of the immigrants receiving coveted H-1B visas for the U.S. And it's a safe bet that some of them will eventually find their way to the C-suite. politics to the world of business every weekday at 5 p.m eastern time hosts Anne marie hordern and joe matthew alongside kaylee lines deliver news insight and analysis live from bloomberg's washington headquarters get the latest from and about politics biggest power players at the end of every trading day balance of power every weekday at 5 p.m eastern time only on bloomberg your global business authority 
authorities. Good face, bigger challenge. It was going to keep rain while coming. This is a three. As the economic picture down. Is it the okay is getting ready to make this? Okay, so you're moving in on me, quick. Distracting oh, yeah. me with your fancy hands. <laughs> I'm going to deal with your knight, because it's really bothering me. Ah, my knights. Yeah, he's a troublemaker. Yeah. What did you get up to this weekend? Uh, you know, just robot stuff. A lot of chess. I was practicing for, uh, for you. I know you're pretty good. Ooh, I don't like that. I will take this. Uh, put it over here. Not cool. Not cool. All right. I will, I will concede. I can see. Ah. Got me beat. <laughs> Very good game. Well played. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg UK, a special focus on the biggest challenges facing the British government, the economy, financial services, and markets. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the London's IPO market has been dealt another blow. We Soda, the world's largest producer of natural soda ash, has cancelled its plans to list in the city just two weeks after making an announcement blaming extreme investor caution. Now, the move has dashed to London's hopes of recovery from the ongoing IPO drought. It does come after UK chip design giant Arm decided to list in New York, and Bloomberg data actually shows that just under $600 million has been raised so far this year. Well, I spoke to the We Soda chief executive, Alistair Warren, a short time ago, and he told me it would be logical for the company to be on the New York Stock Exchange. The, the good news about our IPO was we attracted a very broad range of investor interest. The, the bad news and the reason we ultimately pulled the IPO was because whilst we were prepared to accept, you know, the normal valuation discount that you get at IPOs, the, where investors got to was such an extreme position that we just took a view that the valuation just didn't make sense for us. And given that we didn't need the money, we decided to um, pull the IPO. If you had decided to list elsewhere, do you think the IPO would have gone ahead? I think within the European markets at large, I don't think it would have made a difference. I don't think this is a London versus Paris versus Amsterdam issue. I think it's an interesting debate as to whether the US would be, have been more supportive, but that makes no sense for our business today. Um, so, so I think within the context of Europe, it would have probably ended up with a broadly similar outcome. Well, that was the We Soda chief executive Alistair Warren speaking to Bloomberg a short time ago about the company's abandoned London IPO. Now we're joined by Laura Citron, chief executive officer of London Partners, and Ishita Cabra Davies, the CEO and founder of Buy Rotation. So thank you both. We have a wonderful entrepreneur, and we have someone who's meant to sell London as a destination to a lot of businesses that want to come to London. Laura, uh, first of all, how much of a blow is it to you know the IPO market? If you look at a various stage, so you start a company, you need funding, you sell customers customers, you become bigger, you get VC maybe, you know, money in. And then at some point, if you want to be really big, you list. It, what's the most difficult part if you want to do business in the UK? So IPOs for tech do matter. And there's clearly an issue at the moment. And the government's acknowledged that, the London Stock Exchange has acknowledged that, and they're working on plans to fix it. I think it's really important that we don't use tech IPOs as the only metric yeah. of success for tech in this city. And when I think about it as a city leader, why do we care about tech? It creates great jobs. It pays taxes to fund our public services. It improves productivity. And we create products that make people's lives better and help the planet. And if we look at it through that lens, tech has been a huge success story for London in the past 10 years. And we should be really pleased with that. Is there a danger, or is that as we move on, that actually tech is becoming second fiddle to something else, or that there are other places in the world, it could be Amsterdam, for IPOs, not necessarily only tech, or France, that have rolled out the red carpet, and so attract more business, because it's just easier to, to get things done? 
So London is still clearly the dominant tech center in Europe and top three globally. We're raising about double the level of VC capital in London of, of Paris or Berlin that are, the that are the next two biggest. But I think more broadly, we need to compete as a European ecosystem to develop a European technology sector that can compete with the US and China and increasingly actually also India. So from a London perspective, what matters to us is that we're really, really well connected with those other key tech cities in Europe you've mentioned, whether it's Amsterdam, Paris, Berlin, Stockholm, Tel Aviv, so that the entrepreneurs from those cities can come to London to raise their later stage capital, can expand, benefit from the market here, and use it as that, that gateway to the rest of the world that London has always been. Um, so, Shida, talk to me a little bit about your business. You have a business called By Rotation, which is basically a peer-to-peer fashion rental platform. You went through $3 million in terms of seed funding. Is it, like, what's your, your biggest challenge right now? Well, I would say we've just sort of expanded now to the U.S. last month, and I think it's really about making roads in the U.S. Uh, we've got an amazing business model where it's very scalable. Everything's done in-house, headquartered here in London. Um, and it's really about, you know, kind of getting our name out there in the U.S., and I think what's been really exciting, again, you know, being a startup that was born in London, mm -hmm. is that if you can make it in London, if you can be a big fish here, you will make it in the U.S. as well. Mm -hmm. And I can't really say the same for other markets. You know, if you make it in another country, mm -hmm. in the main city, it's not confirmed that you will actually have such a status when you go abroad to such a big market. Yeah, and I'm clear. And we've seen also, you know, tech not related to fashion, but you see a lot of the financial big banks trying out some of the retail consumer products here in the UK. And I don't know whether because we're just much more savvy and it's a good market yeah. to then roll it out, or it's just a harder market to penetrate and make a real difference. I mean, I feel like the, the customer, the consumer here is really savvy. So if you can convince them, you can convince a lot of various other markets, and again, larger markets such as the US. So we definitely feel like the UK, which is probably one six, one eight of the US. If we can make it here, we can experiment here, we can use the lessons that we've learned and brought it yeah. to a bigger, perhaps more expensive market as the US. Yeah. I say that as an early stage founder. Um, Laura, so I was also at London Tech Week. I know uh, London Partners was heavily involved. I had a good conversation there with the leader of the opposition, Keir, Keir Starmer. What does government need to do now to make investors, maybe international investors, feel more welcome in the UK? So government is really looking at, at what they can do to continue the success story of tech in the UK. So there's a lot of talk at the moment about how we can get our pension funds to be investing more into, into growth companies. And I think that's a really exciting area. Um, entrepreneurs talk a lot about migration. And London has always been this fantastic hotbed of talent. A lot of the investors that we talk to bring their businesses to London because you can recruit from amazing universities. But I think we look at the last 10 years in London, we have had more tech companies come and set up in London than anywhere else in the world. So we've got a really great mix of ingredients, and I think we need to continue to invest in it. So when you look at some of the questions, and thank you, all of our viewers, I know we are touching on something that's very close to the heart of people that watch us, and we have viewers, of course, writing in with a question. And so, Laura, I think this one's for you. Um, how do you think big firms like NatWest are performing about supporting IPOs uh, in London? So we've seen a lot of the big banks really trying to get into this high growth space. And on Monday this week, for example, we saw the what was Silicon Valley Bank US relaunch as HSBC Innovation Banking. Um, the reason that, that businesses do well in London is because they can get capital to grow. And that's something that's really changed. If we go back 10, 15 years, you could do an early stage startup in London, but you couldn't really scale. You just weren't going to raise your later series. That's really shifted. And we are seeing not only banks, but also institutional investors being much more active in that later stage market. That's really exciting for London. And that's why if we roll back to 10 years when London Tech Week started. We only had 10 unicorns, billion dollar companies here. We've now got over 100. That's because you can now raise those bigger rounds. So what are some of the questions that you're asking yourself, uh, Ashita, right now? Are you already thinking about an exit plan, or are you just growing the business and see how it happens? I mean, we're three and a half years old, so there's a long way to go, I do believe. Um, and you've got a lot of success stories in the circular fashion space. You know, you've got vintage, you've got a lot of like 
you know, Depop now being acquired by Etsy. So I do think there's, you know, we're, we're just sort of growing, and the market is, um, you know, fashion rental in particular, is going to uh, grow by 3x um, just by 2030. So that is something that we're looking to continue expanding. Yeah. Uh, with the US launch, I mean, we've been really dubbed more as the Airbnb of designer fashion. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity is a $100 billion company, really, in the sharing economy space. But, actually, and, and this is a business model, right, that it has been tried before. There was my wardrobe, there's like Rent the Runway. Ha, ha, what's, what are you doing differently that, that will set you apart? So both those businesses that you mentioned, they're very inventory heavy. So they have warehouses and sea caucus in Texas. Uh, we're talking about, you know, connecting people, a social marketplace, really, you know, also dubbed as the Instagram of fashion rental, where people can rent and lend with each other. Some of our top lenders make more than 3,000 pounds a month as a side hustle of lending out their belongings to each other. And I think that's the beauty of what we do at Buy Rotation. All right, thank you both. Laura Citron, the Chief Executive of London and Partners, Ishita Cabra Davies, the Chief Executive and Founder of Buy Rotation, both stay with us. So we'll have plenty more on Bloomberg UK. as safe as it was when you were in the government? It's not as safe as it was. Crime is clearly rising. I mean, it's not back to the dark old days of, you know, pre-Giuliani in the early 90s. But we got to be careful because safety is the foundation of everything. And so I know the current mayor is committed to reducing crime. Um, but we're going to have to be incredibly aggressive in making sure that crime does not increase. Are you involved any longer in New York City matters or your advisor? Yeah, the City? mayor and governor actually asked me to co-chair a panel or a task force on reviving the commercial districts throughout the city. So I've been in the middle of that. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua, Thursdays at 9.30 a.m., only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month. about our IPO was we attracted a very broad range of investor interest. The, the bad news and the reason we ultimately pulled the IPO was because whilst we were prepared to accept, you know, the normal valuation discount that you get at IPOs, the, where investors got to was such an extreme position that we just took a view that the valuation w just didn't make sense for us and given that we didn't need the money, we decided to um, pull the IPO. If you had decided to list elsewhere, do you think the IPO would have gone ahead? I think within the European markets at large, I don't think it would have made a difference. I don't think this is a London versus Paris versus Amsterdam issue. I think it's an interesting debate as to whether the US would be, have been more supportive, but that makes no sense for our business today. Um, so, so I think within the context of Europe, it would have probably ended up with a broadly similar outcome. But, but had you tried to list it in New York, you think you would have had a, a better chance of going through it? Had your business model permitted it because of what? Is it capital flows? Is it investors? I, yeah, look, I think ultimately the, the issue in, in Europe is that there's a very high level of caution because, frankly, the IPO market has been closed for such a long time. Obviously, there's been one or two and some notably uh, sort of big name uh, IPOs that have, that have got done, but generally it's been closed. And I, I think that, you know, today uh, there's just such a level of caution, such a, a fear 
uh, of what will happen in the aftermarket, that people just drive ever lower values. And what you really need is, is a group of investors that are prepared to look at a company on its strengths, its fundamentals, and have the conviction to step forward. That was the We Soda Chief Executive Alistair Warren speaking to us a short time ago about the company's abandoned London IPO. Britain's ambitions, though, as an AI superpower have been boosted. Generative AI startups, Enthesia Chief Executive Victor Riparbelli has talked up the UK's ability to be an AI leader. I'm definitely pro-regulation. I think we should set up the right guardrails for this technology. The UK has a lot of the ingredients required to actually be an AI superpower, which I think every government in the world right now wants to be an AI superpower. I think few countries have it's basically the talent density that we have in the UK. So I think that's something that would, um, that would rule in favor of the UK actually having a good shot at being, being an amazing uh, hub for, for AI moving forward. Still with us, Laura Citron, Chief Executive Officer of London and Partners, and Ashita Kabar Davies, the CEO and founder of By Rotation. So but thank you both for, for sticking around. Um, Laura, again, I mean, you focus in a lot of basically attracting business to London and the UK, especially London. And it's interesting to see the government, hear the government want to be this like AI super regulator. Does that attract business with it? Or d d because you're a super regulator, it actually means that there's less capital flows in this space? I think if we look at the, the analogy of fintech, where London and the UK have had a, taken a pretty innovative and progressive approach, that's actually really driven the growth of the fintech center, because we've seen fintech businesses from around the world come to London to innovate in the regulatory sandbox. So if we can take a similar approach around AI, be the, the country that's setting those globally recognized standards, it can be really powerful for, for driving innovation. But as we just heard from Synthesia, Regulation isn't the only factor that businesses look at when they think about where they went to set up. And for AI, talent is a huge driver. Yeah. And the fact that London's universities and the UK's universities are really strong on AI will also make a big difference. How has Brexit impacted? And we talk about the skill shortage. And I don't know whether it is education and retraining, or is it also Brexit, meaning that you know, so many Europeans have had to go back home? So what we've seen in London is a, a shift in where our international students are coming from. We have fewer European students, but we actually have record numbers of international students. They're just coming from different places around the world. And entrepreneurs that, that we talk to, and we have thousands of entrepreneurs from around the world in London this week for London Tech Week, still find that London is a huge draw for talent. That's partly because of the universities and the students, but also because it's just a great place to live, so people want to relocate here. Yeah, so what's your big, it is a great place to live. I concur with that. Um, Ishita, when you look at some of the challenges going forward, what is it? Is it regulation? Is it attracting talent? Is it platform? Is it technology? So I was actually just going to add, because I'm an immigrant founder myself, and I came here as an international school student, and I love the fact that actually now you have talent from all over the world as well, uh, which is fantastic. I think the biggest challenge for us, probably more as a consumer early stage startup, is that there's less love for consumer startups, I will say, in the space at the moment. So I, I do feel like there's quite a bit of funding for health tech, fintech, uh, but there's probably less of a focus on consumer because the consumer is probably a bit uh, mindful of how they're spending. But I guess lucky for us at Buy Rotation, you know, that's a tailwind for us because people are reconsidering how they spend and instead they're investing in higher quality pieces and then lending them out on the Buy Rotation app. Okay, so interesting. Thank you both for joining us. Laura Citron, the CEO of London and Partners, and Ashita Cabrat Davies, the CEO and founder of Buy Rotation. Now, Bloomberg is compiling a list. This is very exciting. We're compiling a list of the UK's most promising startups. If you know about a company that's doing something really innovative and unique and deserves some extra attention, let us know. You can e email us at ukstartups at bloomberg.net. Coming up, AI is all the buzz, and next we'll speak to someone who's right in the middle of it. Stability AI Chief Executive Emad Mostak joins us next live from the Founders Forum. This is Bloomberg. Japan's critical role in the global economy is changing as the world recalibrates. After decades of stagnation, Japan's leaders are forging a more innovative and sustainable path forward to revitalize the nation. Corporate giants, policymakers, and pioneers tell us how they're doing just that. Every week on Japan Ahead, right here on Bloomberg Television.
People ask me all the time, what is the key to being a really good investor? And I tell them it's to surround yourself with and work with the best investors you can find. On Bloomberg Wealth, I'm going to take you to meet the greatest investors in the world, the people that I would like to have managing my money. Today, I would say perhaps only second to AI right now, which is AI has got so much going on that folks are so excited about it. Climate tech is the hottest area to, to be in. BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. Mar Studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts have the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch. Plus, the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West, only on Bloomberg Television, your global business authority. Business Week Radio, live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talking. Come on, aren't you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed does, yeah. potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. of politics to the world of business. Every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, hosts Anne-Marie Hordern and Joe Matthew, alongside Kaylee Lines, deliver news, insight, and analysis live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. Get the latest from and about politics' biggest power players at the end of every trading day. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. The worst scenario would be a Europe that would invest much less than the United States or China, not be able to create the great champions, but instead a Europe that would start with regulation. This scenario is possible. It is not the one we stand for, and it is not the one I will support. Well, that was French President Emmanuel Macron warning that Europe should not fall behind on AI at the Viva Tech conference in Paris. Now, let's have a look at uh, the UK. There are a couple of stories that we need to really focus on. First of all, the UK a grid expecting renewables to curb blackout risks next winter. Now, this is a great story by our Todd G uh, Gillespie. Basically, lower demand could also play a factor in maintaining a reliable system. And a national grid ran a program last winter for households to earn money for reducing power use. This is a great story uh, that we're, of course, looking at. The forecast is indicating more breathing room for the UK, whilst at the same time navigating out of this historic energy crisis that triggered um, record bills for consumers and intense demand on supply. So let's take a look at what the markets are watching out for today. The ECB rate decision, of course, is on everyone's mind. It's expected at 1.15 p.m. UK time. That's followed by U.S. initial jobless claims data for the period to June 10th, back to the ECB after that. Of course, the ECB President Christine Lagarde will hold a press conference at 1.45 p.m. UK time. You can watch that on LiveGo. U.S. wholesale inventories, of course, for April come in at 3 p.m. And lastly, a NATO meeting between defense ministers kick off in Brussels today. So investors, chief executives, political leaders meeting at the Founders Forum to discuss the future of the tech-enabled industries, unsurprisingly AI dominating as one of the hot spots at this year's event. Well, let's go to our Tom McKenzie, who's at the event with an important guest. Tom. Francie, thank you very much indeed. Yes, very pleased to say I'm joined by Imad Mostak, who's the CEO of Stability AI. You can put them in the same category as the likes of DeepMind, as the likes of OpenAI, in terms of developing these AI gener generative and LLM AI uh, models. And it's an open source platform and model that you are building out, Imad. I want to get to your views on the opportunities, the risks, the regulatory environment. I have to start with the investigation by Forbes. They claimed in their piece that you exaggerated some of your claims, that you, in fact, even misled your 
investors, your, your response, Imad, to, to, to that piece, to those accusations? I think it was pretty sad. Um, we posted a response, and we've got lots of announcements coming out directly addressing things such as our amazing Amazon partnership, the models that we create, and more. I think it's going to be increasingly important as we move to a more AI-generated age as well to use this technology to really separate the fact from the fiction and others. So on the one hand, you will have more and more spurious claims. On the other hand, we can use this technology to really break these things down. I've spoken to a number of people who've met you face to face. All of them uniformly say he's an incredibly bright, intelligent guy. He's a visionary. But there is a question, Imad, about whether there is a bit of a propensity to exaggerate. Do you accept at least that there has been some exaggeration? I think I get excited, but you know, there are things like my MA is in the post from Oxford and others. Um, this is an exciting area, but I try to keep factual at all times. And again, I think the truth is always out. You just do good things, you stick to the truth, and you go from there. What do you think about the risks around AI? Do you align with the likes of Jeffrey Hinton? Do you align with Elon Musk, who says you need a six-month pause? Do you worry about extinction as a result of generative AI? I, I was the only person of the major AI CEOs to sign both letters um, calling for a pause, because while my base belief is that we'll be OK, what if I'm wrong? I think we're feeding these AIs junk. We're scraping the whole of the internet. Like, yesterday, there was a report in the information about OpenAI using all of YouTube to train GPT-4. No wonder they turn out a bit weird. We need to feed them better data. We need to do it now before it goes from OpenAI and DeepMind training those models to dozens of companies. Joe Lonsdale telling us earlier that he thinks the EU could be committing regulatory suicide with its AI plan. Do you agree with that? I think it's making it incredibly difficult for innovation in the EU. Again, I agree that there needs to be some regulation and guardrails, but this is empowering the incumbents with the latest act that was released yesterday. And unfortunately, I mean, that includes us. It's beneficial for us because we're coordinating open source AI. But this is required for productivity gains that will drive economic growth going forward. So make it easy to enable that, otherwise you'll fall Just behind your competitors. Brief, how do you compete with the likes of Meta, with the likes of OpenAI? They have all this investment. How are you competing? And are you raising additional funds? Do you need to raise additional funds? We have constant interest for additional funding. At the moment, we have not needed it. Um, we will scale eventually. The way that we compete is that we've built communities and we create open source light models that work on the edge as opposed to gigantic models. And I think the industry is moving towards that swarm dynamic. The other part is that you can't use private Bloomberg data with OpenAI and many of these other proprietary models. For every regulated data, every government, they will all run on open auditable models. So our market is completely different and much larger than all of them. And so that's been our focus. So to be clear, you're not looking at additional funding, or you are in the process of trying to raise additional funds? We have had consistent interest from investors. At the moment, we haven't opened up it's our data. It's not more challenging right now? No. We get messages every single okay. day. We're the only multimodal AI company in the world, apart from OpenAI, and there's some very exciting announcements coming up. OK. Imad Mostak, thank you very much indeed. The CEO of Stability AI, really at the forefront amongst the, a number of others in terms of these generative AI models. Francine. I love this. It's like, you know, difficult interviews, but with the sound of music background. Tom, of course, on the ground at Founders Forum. We'll have plenty more from Tom throughout the day. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour with Kriti Gupta in New York, Anna Edwards in London. A couple of other things we need to tell you about. There is a great podcast that I do with Dave Mary called In the City. Uh, we do focus on tech, and uh, of course, Dave also spoke to the London mayor, Sadiq Khan. So that's out today. Check it out on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is Bloomberg. As you look back on your career, what would you say is the best investment advice you've ever received? Probably the best investment advice that I never received, but that I've lived my whole life around, is surround yourself with really good people. I thought about it just today, like I do many times, you know, what makes a great investor? A great investment firm is comprised of people who are optimists and pessimists and realists. Because in the intersection of the debates that go across that wide range of personalities is where you find truth. It's part of the reason I'm so focused on freedom of expression. 
I see it in my own four walls, the, the robust and fulsome debates around how we commit our capital, what defines a good idea, what businesses to build or pursue. That's what drives the success at Citadel. And I've, I've been very fortunate in life to have always had a group of friends who really push me, who make me better. And here, I get to work with 3,500 colleagues who, in their ways, make me better each and every day. And collectively, as a team, we've had the opportunity to have an incredible impact on the financial landscape around the world. Bloomberg UK, your source for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services, and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Facing some tough challenges. Higher living and education costs and wages that aren't keeping up with inflation are making it harder for them to support themselves. And they're relying more on the bank of mom and dad. A new bank rate report shows nearly 70% of parents with kids 18 and older are putting their own finances in danger to help them. About half are dipping into their emergency savings or delaying paying off debt, while 43% drain their retirement funds. So where do you draw the line? There seems to be a generational gap as older parents can't understand why being self-sufficient now is a lot harder than it was for them. Gen Z seems to think on average that 22 is a benchmark for covering the expenses, while baby boomers say their adult children should pay their own way closer to age 20. Either way, it's a family decision. Bankrate suggests having a conversation with your kids and setting a specific dollar amount or time frame for footing the bill. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. China ramping up efforts to boost its economy. The PBOC cuts its medium-term lending facility rate as Beijing raises expectations for more stimulus amid growing signs of a weakening economy. Over in the U.S., the Fed pauses its string of rate hikes, with Chair Powell striking a hawkish tone. He says a rate cut is years away, with risks to inflation still to the upside. And central bank decisions continue with the ECB, expected to deliver what could be its penultimate rate hike later today. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. And we got a revision to the dot plot then, Kriti, and equity markets didn't fall off a cliff. Uh, perhaps they're having a, another think about that this morning. Still not falling off a cliff, but just re retreating slightly. Perhaps a little bit. And look, the question it comes about is how much of the conversation we heard from Chairman Powell yesterday was, at the end of the day, priced in. Remember, Anna, we've seen a lot of optimism going into the Fed meeting, which we traditionally don't see on those Federal Reserve days. So how well did the Federal Reserve ultimately guide market participants on exactly what they were going to do. That's going to be a question we explore throughout the rest of the show. As far as kind of the shock in markets, the concept of higher rates for longer is really interesting because now if you look at the bond market, the concept of Fed cuts this year has been completely wiped out. You're not seeing that priced in anywhere into the market. We're going to discuss throughout the show about whether or not that is a fair assumption on the market's behalf. For now, futures lower by about two-tenths of one percent. Again, kind of normal given that we had this run-up to uh, the Federal Reserve decision. You can hide even argue you kind of buy the room or sell the news, seeing a little bit of that in features this morning. But 4409, remember, we're getting closer and closer to 4500, that technical target that a lot of strategists on Wall Street are saying that's how we're going to end 2023. So interesting that we are still staying above 4400 on that 
level. The two-year yield gets interesting here because, again, higher rates for longer suggests a higher yields, perhaps, for longer as well. 472 on the two-year yield, higher by about three basis points. Where the yields go, the dollar follows. Those interest rate differentials are going to start to push the dollar or at least create a little bit of a floor for the greenback. 1230 on the Bloomberg dollar index, higher by one-tenth of one percent. I wouldn't call it major conviction, Anna, just because we do have other central bank decisions, uh, the ECB later today, and, of course, the BOJ overnight as well. So that's going to influence the dollar as well. But for now, a little bit of strength there. NYMEX crude gets interesting because as we talk about recession watch, a 68 handle on NYMEX crude. Uh, it's interesting that it's staying below 70 here, despite perhaps a little bit of the risk factors increasing higher by about two tenths of 1%. But again, a lot of the action that's going to drive today's trading session isn't coming from the Federal Reserve. It's coming from Asia, specifically China. Overnight, you really saw kind of a net net uh, very little gains across the Asia Pacific region, but outperformance in China given the stimulus story. That's going to be really important when you look at the Hang Seng Index higher by 2% overnight. What's interesting to me, though, is the FX story because you are, of course, seeing uh, the dollar yuan now hit another low. 7.16 is what we're seeing on that currency pair. Interesting, again, to watch how you trade that despite the liquidity issues you sometimes enter when you see the, the Chinese market. Dollar yen is also something we're going to be watching. Another low for the BOJ. What does the BOJ overnight do to perhaps stem those losses 141 on that currency pair and we have to explore the Australian yield as well because we did get an inverted curve there Anna off extremely hot employment data so the story of a tight tight labor market is truly a global one yeah, absolutely. The tight labor market story rings true. We are also focused on that China data here in Europe, also focused on the retail sector. We've got some moving parts there. But uh, post the Fed, of course, this is the first time that the European markets get a chance to react to it. We saw a little bit of weakness coming through in the early part of the European session, uh, in particular over, uh, on, uh, on the German and on the French markets. The uh, Italian market also under a little bit of pressure. No big moves. Some of the markets pairing their earlier losses. So the FTSE and the IBEX both off earlier lows. We're heading towards an ECB meeting, of course, today. Day. We will not lose sight of that. Let's have a look at some of the sectors and other news flow that we're dealing with here in Europe. And basic resource is a really interesting one. We've got a bit of uh, maybe read across from the China story. Weak data out of China. Maybe there's an opportunity with a stimulus in China uh, to take another look at basic resource stocks. That was certainly what I heard from Barclays a little bit earlier on today. But for the moment, they're selling off. But also there's paper and packaging in the mix with basic resource stocks in Europe. And it is some of the restructuring stories in uh, Finland uh, amongst the, the uh, paper and packaging sector that are having an impact there. H&M, this is the retail story I mentioned, up by 4.9%. One of the stocks in this sector, ASOS, also updating today, along with H&M, they had an update. Both of them talking pretty positively. ASOS up around 15% in session today. Uh, the, the update's coming through more positive than had been anticipated, according to some analysts. And talking about the month of June in much more favorable terms than some had expected, so H&M goes higher. The Italian five-year yield, I put it in because across Europe we're seeing higher yields today. Uh, a little bit of factoring in what we heard from the Fed perhaps yesterday, but also uh, moving away, moving to Towards, sorry, the ECB, and we are expecting to see increased interest rates there. Now, this is a really fascinating commodity story to watch. This is the gas benchmark for Europe, up by 11% today, Chrissy, and this is the third day of gains we've seen here. Week to date, we're looking at 30% uh, gains for gas prices, and this is not the winter, this is the summer, but it's the hot weather here in Europe that is prompting these concerns around tightness of supply, especially with maintenance activity taking place in Norway. So we're back to worrying just at the margins about natural gas prices. And part of one of the kind of bull cases for inflation that's going to be higher for longer is that commodity story, Anna, which almost feels like the market's saying, okay, we're going to deal with that later, especially when you talk about the China story, uh, which you brought up uh, quite a bit in the European story, brought it up in the U.S. trading story as well. So let's explore that theme a little bit. China's weakening economy prompted its central bank to cut its one-year loans rate for the first time since August, and expectations are growing for even more stimulus. Joining us now to break it all down, Bloomberg's Sophia Horta y Costa in Hong Kong. Sophia, we've seen in the Spanish of just this week, two different types of rate cuts. For our international audience, explain to us the significance of what the PBOC is doing. How are they approaching the long-term growth story? So this week is really the week that the PBOC shifted from the wait and see mode that they had um, until now. Uh, you know, they, they've been waiting essentially for the reopening story to help growth, and that hasn't worked. So this week they've shifted into stimulus mode, and we had that interest rate cut, which was unexpected earlier this week, uh, that now followed through with another interest rate cut. And this is the one that matters because it's the one-year policy rate. I'm not going to go into the details because China has far too many rates for anyone to keep track of. We could also get another interest rate 
cut next week, but we'll go into that later. But essentially what the PBOC is doing is saying to the market, hey, we're listening. We know that the economic recovery is a lot weaker than anticipated, than, the, than we had hoped. And the post-COVID recovery story is not strong enough. So here we are, we're kicking in, uh, we're kicking it into action and we're really kind of looking at what the data is showing us cutting interest rates has more of a signaling power to the market and to the economy, to consumers, than actually an impact, a direct impact on monetary policy. Okay, so we've got the weak data, we've got the support for monetary policy. Uh, where is the weakness in the data then, uh, Sophia, that is prompting this? And therefore, where is fiscal support going to, going to fall, going to be used to help out the Chinese economy? Yes, Anna, so there's three kind of areas that Beijing is particularly concerned about, and we heard that today from the MBS briefing after the data, which is the property market. Let's not forget that's been in a record downturn, and home sales uh, are, are, are continuing to be soft, and actually home prices rose just 0.1% in May from the prior month, really, really coming off a low base from last year as well. So the property market, that's a slower recovery, and it's a huge part of GDP. So that's one thing that we know that Beijing is going to target. The consumer story as well, let's not forget, you know, in other economies when uh, COVID zero or the strictest COVID measures were scrapped, people went out to spend, you know, we're not seeing that in China. So really trying to revive the consumption story, that's where Beijing wants growth to come from this year, given the concerns around debt. So the consumer story, very much a concern. And the other one is youth unemployment, Anna. Today's number was again ugly. It's reaching, uh, it reached 20.8%. That's a record high for youth unemployment in China. And that's only going to worsen. You know, we get the, the summer graduating season, yeah. more people, more young people coming to the market. So that's really a top of mind for policymakers. Bloomberg, Sophia, Horta y Costa, walking us through a very complicated Chinese recovery story. We thank you as always. We go from the China story to the U.S. story across the Pacific, turning there to the FOMC, hitting the pause button on rates. But Fed Chair Powell indicated more hikes are still on the way as they stick to their inflation goals. Joining us now with more is Bloomberg's Valerie Titel. Valerie, this market seems unfazed by all the warnings that Chair Powell had in his message yesterday. What do you make of it? Yeah, unfazed and basically just confused. That was the message the market got yesterday. Uh, the S&P 500 index uh, ended the session hardly changed, and two-year yields only budged two basis points higher. That is despite probably the most hawkish set of dots that the market was expecting, reflecting not only one, but two more hikes maybe in the cards this year. But look, Critty, during the press conference, it was not backed up by any urgency to use these hikes. It wasn't backed up by any hawkish language almost a kind of ambivalence over whether whether they will need to use them, just leaving the market quite unsure whether they're going to get to this five and three quarters terminal rate that was reflected in the dot plot. In fact, as this chart shows on screen, the market pricing of the terminal rate hardly budged. It's still solidly around 5.3%. Didn't necessarily get dragged higher by those hawkish dots. And frankly, the hawkish thing that Powell really said was that he was going to use the last month's data when they come to make the decision in July. So perhaps, just perhaps, they'll take into consideration the hot data we've had uh, in the previous month when they do make their next rate decision uh, in July. He was asked many times, if this dot plot is re reflecting two more hikes, why don't you just raise rates today? And he followed with this uh, uh, laying out three variables that he's concerned with. Speed of hikes, the ultimate level of hikes, and the time at which they hold those hikes there. And he said, I'm not concerned with speed anymore. Speed isn't our biggest issue right now is we need to slow down so we can finesse the correct level of hitting this terminal rate before we spend some time holding rates high. Okay, Valerie, thanks very much. Bimbo's Valerie Titel joining us uh, with analysis of the Fed's uh, decision and press conference yesterday and some of the market moves. Now the focus shifts to the ECB, of course, expected to raise rates later today as investors keep a close eye on the bank's forward guidance. For more, Maria Tadeo joins us live from Frankfurt. Maria, what do we expect then from the ECB? 
Uh, yes, Anna, good morning. I think for starters, obviously, a monetary policy decision that is very well calibrated, and that is another hike, another 25 basis points. That should take, in principle, that deposit rate to 3.5%. We're also waiting uh, for updated macro projections for the euro area. And you just talked about the Fed and this idea of global central banks. Of course, we know that they always keep an eye on what they're doing. They do so in the name of global coordination for the global uh, economy. But one of the questions, of course, is will this have an impact on the ECB? When it comes to today's decision, obviously not. Uh, Madame Lagarde has been clear that on this journey, as she likes uh, to say, to bring down inflation to target, the ECB is not Fed dependent. It is data dependent. But there is a common thread which has to do with the end game. And one of the fascinating topics in this meeting will be that the calibration to the end. I'm not saying today is a final hike. It will not be July. It's obviously very much in the cards, but we're getting to that point where you're, you're about to reach that home stretch. And that is obviously one of the trade offs for the European Central Bank become complicated, where you do see that sometimes consensus in the governing council can get heated. And this is a constant balancing act for the central bank. It's 20 different economies. And as you know, well, one mandate, but a lot of issues that they have to calibrate that work for everyone. Right, and of course, at the heart of the story with the PBOC and the Federal Reserve, as you just mentioned, is the growth uh, piece of the equation. We have economic projections from the ECB today as well. What should we be looking out for? Uh, look, to me, there's two things. The inflation number, of course, is the medium term. It's, it's a 2024, it's a 2025. It's that idea of what happens in the medium term, because we know the central bank at this point, yeah, they look at the monthly data, but there's a lot of seasonal factors that feed into this. Uh, we know that energy has been very volatile. That immediately brings down or up headline inflation. What they care about is a medium term outlook so that they're now convinced that the forces of monetary policy have really kicked in and will bring inflation closer to target. The other number, to me, particularly important this time around, has to be GDP. We know the euro area is now in a technical recession. How do they see it? Is it a mild one? Or actually, there's something now that is fundamentally concerning in the medium term. Maria, thanks very much. Maria today, our colleague there on the ground for us in Frankfurt with all you need to know ahead of the ECB's meeting. We will get great analysis on the Fed next. Coming up on the program, the former vice, uh, Fed Vice Chair Richard Clarida joins us with analysis of what we heard from the Fed and his assessment of the U.S. economy. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. years at Chipotle, this was, you come into Chipotle along the line, you interact with the crew, and you customize your meal. We've got this separate make line, and it's digitized, and so the orders come in, and they're, they're really kind of staged so that if you say at noon, I want to come in at 1 o'clock, we hold that order, and we will send it to the crew like maybe 10 to 1, right. so it's ready right when you pull up your car. How do you manage these kind of two different staffing needs, right, yes. and making sure you have the right amount of people yes. at, the, at the right, right time? We spend a lot of time uh, projecting sales. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, it's part art, part science. We're trying to bring more science and more AI into it. Because yeah. if you get the right sales projection, then you know exactly what your sale, what your staffing needs to be. So if you get the sales right, you can get the entire restaurant staffed perfectly. With just a couple people, our, our average restaurant now does about um, over a million dollars per restaurant in digital sales. Our studios in New York and San Francisco. Our expert hosts have the data and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch. Plus, the interviews you don't want to miss. Watch Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow on Bloomberg Technology, the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action. 12 p.m. on the East Coast, 9 a.m. in the West. Only on Bloomberg Television, your global business authority.
the full effects of our tightening have yet to be felt. I still think, and my, my colleagues agree, that, that the risks to, to inflation are to the upside still. It will be appropriate to cut rates at such time as inflation is coming down really significantly. And again, we're talking about a couple years out. I would say about, to, about July, two things. One, decision hasn't been made. Two, it, I, I do expect that it will be a live meeting. That was Fed Chair Powell at yesterday's press conference, a really fascinating meeting at a time when the Federal Reserve isn't really changing uh, when it comes to their actual policy rate. Joining us now for more analysis and insight, Richard Clarida, former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve and global economic advisor over at PIMCO. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Walk us through the thinking here. It feels like at the core of the argument of the Federal Reserve is simply that this skip, if you will call it that, is simply based on the idea that the lag needs to kind of catch up a little bit. Is a month enough to see the effects of a lag? Well, it's a good question, you know, and in fact, Critty, and thank you for having me on the show, Anna, as well. Um, the Fed really since November of last year in its statement has been indicating that at some point it would want to pause and take stock because monetary policy does operate uh, with a lag. So in some ways, they've telegraphed for months that they would want to pause or skip, and that's what we saw uh, yesterday. But I do agree, they did mark their projections in directions which showed much slower decline in inflation, uh, much less decline in economic uh, activity, uh, and obviously they shifted up their view that potentially two more hikes are needed. So it was what I would call an awkward but hawkish uh, pause and of course the chair at one point said skip and then he corrected himself but I'll call it a skip <laughs> what then do you need to see in this next meeting to have yet another skip yeah. well they don't they actually don't get a whole lot of data between now and the meeting that's relevant they'll get one more employment report they'll get one more CPI uh, report um, and, um, and, and so I, and I think they did get a question in the audience uh, yesterday along those uh, lines. Um, as the chair indicated, you know, the next meeting is live, which is Fed speak for saying that they could, could, uh, could go. I think market pricing now more or less lines up uh, with where we are, that, that given what we saw yesterday, they'll, they'll probably get that rate hike in at the July uh, uh, meeting. So that, that's the way it looks right now. Uh, good morning to you, Richard. So you would call it a skip. Uh, you, you do like that terminology. You, you've just referenced July. Huh. How many more hikes do you think we have to go then from the Fed? Well, I really think that for the first time in a long time, the Fed is data dependent. Um, I think one reason why market pricing has not fully reflected the second hike, indeed, I think on your show you did mention basically market pricing has one more hike and then the Fed is done, is I think the markets and, and PIMCO has uh, a, a different view of both inflation uh, and activity uh, this, this year. The Fed has inflation coming down more slowly than a lot of folks, uh, and the Fed uh, also has a smaller rise in unemployment uh, than a lot of people expect. And so I do think that if the data is closer to market expectations versus Fed expectations, that they could be done uh, in July. So I really think for the first time in a while, they really are data dependent. So they're data dependent. Is that enough for you to doubt the second dot then, Richard? That seems to be what you're suggesting. I'll put it this way. If, if the rest of the year plays out like their projections and core inflation's running at 3.9%, which is what they had in the projections, uh, then they probably will get that second hike uh, in. But that's higher than we expect, for example, on core inflation. So I think that I think it really is going to come down to how rapidly does the economy uh, disinflate and how rapidly does the unemployment rate go up to uh, support that disinflation? Vice Chair, about a year ago, the idea of a terminal rate at 5% or even higher was unheard of. The, the contrarians uh, were really called out for it. Now, so you have some calls in the marketplace from some major Wall Street strategists saying a terminal rate, especially in this era of long-term sustained inflation, could be as high as 10%. Is that believable to you? No, I, I'm... I, I really don't think so. You know, the well-known uh, Taylor uh, rule or versions that I've worked on uh, a, a, as well, I think for the current state of U.S. data, uh, you would think a rate of around 6% uh, right now uh, would probably be, I think, a plausible 
uh, uh, endpoint. And again, you know, the data could change. If inflation's very sticky and stubborn, then they'd have to do more. But no, 10% doesn't seem uh, in the in the realm of uh, feasibility to me. Talk to us then about the read through into the bond market. You are at the end of the day uh, the economic advisor to PIMCO. Yeah. When it comes to the liquidity story, when it comes to pricing this, are you at all worried that maybe these very quick market fluctuations from multiple rate cuts priced into multiple rate hikes very quickly is going to hurt the bond market more than necessary? It's a great point, because you are right. Objectively, the volatility uh, at the front end of the curve in the last year or so has been at record, uh, at a record uh, level. And just look at daily changes in the two-year yield, for, for, for example. Now, at some level, you know, this has been a complex situation. We had a pandemic. Uh, we had a, a global inflation surge. And we actually had a very hawkish pivot from the Fed in June of last year. So some level of volatility uh, in front end pricing, I think, it just goes with the, just goes with the territory. I, and I actually wrote a piece for PIMCO in December making the point that we would see this tug of war between the Fed communication and market pricing. And we've seen a lot of it. I do think right now, compared to what we saw earlier, that there's, there's less of a disconnect, I think, between the Fed and the markets than there has been in, in, some, in some time. So I don't think it's a concern uh, uh, right now, because we're really much, I think, close to the end of this rate hike cycle, not the beginning. Close to the end of the rate hike cycle, Richard, but what do you see as the medium term landing point, I suppose, here? Do you think we're heading for a period of structurally higher interest rates, medium term, higher than what we have known of late? Great question. You know, we just explored this in, in PIMCO's most recent secular forum, and our baseline view is that the Fed and the ECB uh, and other central banks will ultimately do what it takes to anchor inflation expectations close or at, at, at their targets. And, and once they get there, and it may take a couple years, we do think that policy rates will be more or less in the range that we saw uh, before the, the pandemic. But the challenge now uh, is that uh, inflation's too darn high, uh, and, and central banks want to run restrictive policy, but one, they will succeed, and when they do, we do think rates will come down uh, more or less uh, in the range that we saw before the pandemic. So in the U.S., that would be a federal funds rate of, say, 25 to 3%. So you don't buy arguments that suggest that uh, various factors such as geopolitical changes uh, will result in a higher structural inflation environment? Exactly. Our baseline view is that it, 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 Anna, it may well result in more inflation pressure and it may make the job of central banks more difficult, uh, but we do believe that they'll do what it takes to, to, to resist uh, that. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and so the destination, we think, is they'll, they'll get there, but the, the rate path required uh, and, and the choices that they have to confront may be more challenging. Vice Chair, when the labor market concerns first arose, I want to say a year and a half or, or two years ago, the concept of a job full recession uh, kind of formed. And, and something interesting that Chairman Powell had said in his press conference, and, and I'm going to quote here, he said, there is a path to getting inflation back down to 2% without having to see the kind of sharp downturn and large losses of employment that we've seen in so many past instances. Does that suggest that a job full recession is on the table? I don't think so, and I, I agree with the chair in the sense that um, the indicators of the labor market I follow, employment cost index uh, and, and similar, indicate to me that wage inflation now is probably about a point above where the Fed would like it and to be consistent uh, with uh, price stability. Um, and, and if you go back and look at, at mild downturns in the U.S., say 2001 or, or 1990, in both of those, the rise in unemployment was about one and a half to two percentage points. Uh, and in those downturns, wage inflation fell by the amount uh, needed. So I could see it. I could see what I would call and what we've called a softish landing uh, in which unemployment ends up somewhere in the fours, maybe the high fours. Um, that would be, I think, a good outcome. It would technically still probably go in the books as a, uh, a recession. I think. Getting the disinflation the Fed is looking for without a technical recession will be difficult, but getting a decline in inflation in a labor market with an unemployment rate, you know, in the mid to high fours is certainly something that, 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 could, uh, that we could see. 
Okay, Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Richard Clarida, former Fed Vice Chairman and Global Economic Advisor at PIMCO, in Europe for us, and so giving us his thoughts post the Fed meeting on their analysis and his thoughts. He'll call it a skip, even if the Fed Chair Jerome Powell didn't want to call it one, he will. Now, coming up on the programme, we'll stick with the Fed story, look ahead to the ECB. Ian Lingen joins us, Head of US Rate Strategy at BMO Capital Markets. Lots more on the Fed. This is Bloomberg. Warren Buffett, the legendary investor, turns 93 this August. His signature must-read letters to shareholders have been getting shorter and shorter. This year's letter contained few fresh ideas. But most investors in a Bloomberg survey say Buffett's steady-eddy approach of buying cheap, safe, high-quality companies will beat the market. They expect returns in his investment company, Berkshire Hathaway, to outperform the S&P 500 over the next five years adding to an incredible run in which Berkshire shares have returned more than 3 million percent in the almost six decades Buffett has led the firm. Investors are also willing to pay up for Berkshire, which owns everything from the railroad BNSF and car insurer Geico to Seize Candies and Coca-Cola. About one-fifth quantify the Buffett premium at more than 10 percent of Berkshire stock price. More than a quarter say it's somewhere between 5 to 10 percent. There is one problem for Berkshire Hathaway, its size. Thanks to a bunch of cash-generating insurance companies, Berkshire has at least $130 billion in cash that it can put to work. But it needs big acquisitions to move the needle. Buffett calls it hunting for elephants. And we know Buffett hates overpaying. So that means sitting tight, patiently waiting for the right moment to pounce on the right company, which might be a drag on performance for now, but as Buffett fans know, usually works out in the long run. In Sydney, from Washington, in Tokyo. 9 a.m. in Beijing and Shanghai. Good morning, everyone. Have a great evening. Here's what I'm watching. You do not want to miss this Is story. There the kind of upside. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. China ramping up its efforts to boost its economy. The PBOC cuts its medium-term lending facility rate as Beijing raises expectations for more stimulus, all as there's signs of a weakening economy. Over in the U.S., the Fed pauses its string of rate hikes, with Chair Powell striking a hawkish tone. He says a rate cut is years away, with risks to inflation still to the upside. And central bank decisions continue with the ECB expected to deliver what could be the penultimate rate hike later today. I'm Krita Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Anna, a lot to digest, but it feels like just maybe in the absence of the Federal Reserve really making bigger waves, the PBOC might have the bigger move on markets today. Well, it's certainly having an impact here in Europe and uh, prompts lots of questions about what other support the PBOC is going to give or fiscal authorities will give perhaps uh, more. Now the question after we've seen that short-term and medium-term cut from Chinese monetary authorities. So that's the China story. It does have a bit of an impact, a bit of a flow through into European stocks, of course. We watch luxury stocks, we watch basic resources with all of that in mind. This is the stock share of 600, actually down by four-tenths of one percent. A little bit of a hangover from the Fed conversation of yesterday, perhaps. U.S. stocks didn't fall on the back of the uh, more hawkish dot 
apart from the Fed, but uh, that's certainly something that is fi uh, factoring through, sweeping through markets, if you like. So we're a little bit weaker here in Europe. And then there's the China conversation. Basic resource stocks down by 1.8%. Yes, there's a stimulus to support the Chinese economy, but there's also the weakness of the data itself. Perhaps that weighs. But also, uh, the basic resource sector here in Europe also includes paper and packaging businesses. And we're seeing some restructuring of those, and that's having a, a downward impact on some of the share prices within that sector. So we watch that carefully. Uh, so that's a sector that weighs up to the downside. Retail is a sector that pushes higher, along with personal consumer goods, uh, discretionary items. So H&M is up by 4.2%. This is the global clothing retailer. They've been talking in much more positive terms about the month of June and also delivering an update for the last quarter that was much more positive than some of the analysts have been expecting. And so that lifts that stock and also lifts others in the space. And natural gas prices, back to talking about this one then, Chrissy. Uh, we've got a move of 14.6% just today in natural gas prices. This is the European benchmark. Concern about maintenance activity taking place in Norway. Also, so that's the supply side. Also concern around the demand side uh, with, of course, uh, what the stimulus measures in China might look like. Will that attract uh, some of that flow, some of that LNG flow into Asia? That's one thing. But also the hot weather here in Europe is certainly raising questions about uh, demand at this time of year. Chrissy? Yeah, and the commodity story as well as the Asia story is going to be feeding into the U.S. growth story, specifically as we talk about China and just how much deflation is exported and the ripple effects on the commodity space. For now, though, you are seeing a little bit of muted price action, and a features down about three-tenths of one percent. It kind of feels like a buy the room or sell the news type of environment off of the Federal Reserve. A two-year yield at about 472, yields higher by about three basis points on the front end of the curve. To me, though, what's interesting is what's happening in the FX space. The greenback's seeing a little bit of strength following the yield story, but we are getting headlines here out of Japan. The Prime Minister, uh, Kishida, saying not thinking of dissolving the diet during current session, of course, refer refer referring excuse me, to some of those debt talks. Remember, a lot of the economists are suggesting that the BOJ will stay uh, put and will stay kind of on pause, not really doing anything on the fears that perhaps Japan may see yet another election or a snap election at that. What that's doing to the dollar-yen story, even though you have seen a lot of strength in, in the greenback against the yen, is perhaps pairing some of that strength back. Still 141.04 on that currency pair. The dollar's still stronger by about seven-tenths of 1%. NYMEX crude also worth hitting, Anna, as you talk about the commodity story. A 68 handle, a little bit of strength there, higher by 1%. But remember, an average move for oil right now is about 3 to 4%. So nothing to really write home about just yet. Yeah, absolutely. It has to be bigger than that to make it onto some people's radar, doesn't it, Chrissy? So let's focus in on what we heard from the Fed. Uh, we just talked to Richard Clarida about his view, formerly vice chair of the Fed, of course. Uh, let's get another view on what's going on in markets and the Federal Reserve's role. Ian Lincoln is uh, joining us, head of U.S. rate strategy at BMO Capital Markets. Ian, very nice to have you with us. We talked to Richard Clarida a moment ago. He seemed to maybe doubt uh, doubt the dots to some degree. He, he could buy into the idea of one more hike from the Fed. He's not really sure about the second one. Do you doubt the dots? I certainly do doubt the dots. Frankly, I think that there's a great deal of information that the FOMC is attempting to communicate through the SCP, and in doing so, they run the risk of confusing market participants, because the fact of the matter is, there's a variety of different opinions on the committee when within the Fed, and the fact is, at the end of the day, there are only a few key decision makers who are ultimately going to drive where policy rates go, and so I think that it is appropriate to fade the dots at this point in the cycle. Why do you suggest that then, Ian? Is it that the inflation environment is weakening faster? Do you see it weakening faster than the Fed does? I expect that over the course of the next two or three months, what we'll see is we'll see a downshift in the core CPI data that had been printing at 0.4 or 0.5 to printing at 0.2 or 0.3. And that will bring the year-over-year -year numbers lower than the Fed is anticipating. And we also have seen an increase of the unemployment rate, three-tenths of a percent off the cycle lows. While headline non-farm payrolls growth has been strong, the reality is that some of the underlying uh, currents within the employment market are concerning and I think really do play into this idea that we might only have one hike left in the cycle. So, Ian, let's then talk about the kind of market read-through here. Off the back of this, this rate decision, we didn't see a ton of reaction in, in the bond market, but let's talk long-term because Chairman Powell made it very clear that inflation is here for longer, higher interest rates are here for longer, really correcting what the market had priced in when it comes to cuts. When it comes to the bond market, we've seen a decades-long bull market for bonds. Does this Is this the start of a reversal of that? Are we in for a 
perhaps multi-year bear market for bonds? I think that's an excellent question and one of the reasons that I expect that there's a bit of disconnect within the market and what the Fed is telling us is what we have seen over the course of the last 25, 30 years has been a massive increase in transparency on the, market, on the part of monetary policymakers. And as a result, we've seen a compression of volatility further out the curve. And that's really what's driven the bull market for bonds. And that is predictability and credibility on the part of the Fed. And the Fed is now engaged in trying to reestablish the credibility that they lost last year. And if they're successful in doing that, then we would expect that the range for Treasury yields will be reestablished and still be comparatively low versus where it might have been 10 or 15 years ago. I love that you use, you use the word credibility because the stakes are so high for the Federal Reserve after calling inflation transitory uh, for so long. Talk to us a little bit, though, about this terminal rate, the target end now at about 5.75%. Uh, is that really sustainable? Is one month really going to give them the room they need to, to reassess the risks? I actually think that they're do they've done a very good job of attempting to change the cadence from every meeting to a meeting on, meeting off, meeting on, meeting off. And if they do actually need to push beyond that 575 to a, excuse me, potentially a place where they have a six handle, I think that they have set themselves up in a way that it's achievable. That being said, I do think that there is a clear message from Powell that we heard, which is it's time to stop and assess and figure out what occurred with the regional banking crisis. Will the associated credit tightening really flow through and slow the velocity of money? And will that be enough of a disinflationary impulse for them to justify being on hold for an extended period from here? Ian, can I ask you about the yield curve and what you are looking for there? If we look at the two cents yield curve, when do you expect it to go positive again? And what will, uh, what will, what will yield levels look like at the time that it does go positive? Trying to get some sort of assessment if this is a bull or a bear steepening that we'd expect to see. I think that ultimately, at the end of the day, what we'll see is we will see a bull steepening of the yield curve driven by the two-year sector. Now, up until this point in the cycle, there had been the perception that effective Fed funds should function as a floor for nominal rates. What we learned this year was that, in fact, that is not the case and that two-year yields and 10-year yields can, tr can trade well below effective Fed funds. And in doing so, that sets the market up to end this year with a bond bullish tone in the front end of the curve as the market begins to price in the at least 100 basis points of rate cuts that the Fed has already told us will occur in 2024. All right, Ian, I'm going to put you on the spot here. 30 seconds. The bond market has completely priced out cuts for this year. What brings that pricing? What reverses it back to say we need a cut? I think that over the course of the summer, what we'll see is a moderation on the inflation front as well as further weakness on the job side. And that will come in the form of a higher unemployment rate more easily than it will in negative non-farm payrolls. So ultimately watching the fundamentals and of course the wage data. As we see nominal wages begin to yeah. calibrate lower, I think that that will be the biggest tell for the market. Ian, thanks so much. Thanks for your time. Ian Lingen of BMO Capital Markets. Thanks for joining us here on the program. Coming up, JP Morgan Global Economist Nora uh, Sensivani joins us to talk us through her view on the global economy. This is Bloomberg. They've always gone together. 
but never before have sports been so massively influential and as lucrative as they are today. NFL, NBA, none of them were what they are today when they were born. There's leagues that are being thought of and built every day. New teams, new leagues, new business models, even entirely new sports. I never in a million years would have thought this is what my life would be like. We set out to find what's happening and what's about to happen at the nexus of business, sports, and culture. Getting involved from a business perspective was something that was very natural and easy transition for me. From the pickleball courts of Arizona, to the Kabaddi tournaments in India, to the cornhole boards at your local tailgate. <laughs> this is what's next in sports. Bloomberg UK, your source for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services, and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Now, it's been a big week for central banks, and there's still more to come with the ECB decision today and the Bank of Japan tomorrow. Joining us now is Nora Sentivani, who's Global Economist at JP Morgan, and here on set with me in London. Nora, nice to have you with us. Thank you for joining, uh, joining us. So the ECB expected to carry on hiking rates, despite the Fed pausing. How, how much more hiking do you think we are uh, going to see from the ECB? That's one of the big things we're tuning in for today, I suppose, from uh, Christine Lagarde. Yes, absolutely. So I think the setup at the moment for central banks is they're making progress, but they're not quite there. So clearly they are guiding us towards further tightening. That's exactly what we expect from the ECB. 25 basis point hike, I think, is very well telegraphed. In terms of the guidance, I think they're going to keep the door open to multiple hikes here. So we see hike... Today and then in July, we do think at this point the July hike will be the last one because we're going to get some data promoting a pause thereafter. But clearly there's a lot of uncertainty here at the moment. Uh, President Lagarde has elaborated uh, pretty much three conditions that would warrant an end to tightening. Uh, the first one was about the inflation outlook. The second is on the current inflation dynamics. And the third one is about the impact that rate hikes are having on growth. Mm. Now, if we look at these three conditions, I think on the inflation outlook, they can probably tick that off. The staff forecast is likely to show inflation coming back to target. But how much weight are central banks really putting on inflation forecast right now after a period where they've significantly yes. overshot. I think in terms of the current inflation dynamics, clearly they, ha they cannot declare victory. Uh, core inflation in particular is stuck at very high levels, around 5%. That's the same for the US, same for the euro area. And then in terms of the impact of tightening on growth, it's not as forceful, perhaps, as, as one would like at this right. point. Yes. How, how do you assess the lags, the transmission mechanism, the, the, the pass-through so far, I suppose, from the ECB? Yeah, I think, look, so far, clearly there's a tightening in overall financial conditions, in credit conditions. We saw reduced demand, didn't we, actually, in some of those surveys? That's true, but... For, for, for credit. Exactly. But ultimately, you know, growth, for, for the time being, is weighed down by the earlier supply shocks. So growth is weak, but it's not so much because of the impact of policy tightening. And I think we can see that most clearly in the labor market, right? The labor market has just remained incredibly resilient across the board. I mean, in the euro area, the unemployment rate is actually 1% percentage point below where it was prior to the pandemic, you see wage growth at extremely strong levels relative to where the ECB would like to see it going. Same thing for unit labor costs. So that doesn't give them a whole lot of confidence in these projections of inflation getting back to target. Nora, you have a real expertise in the EM world, so let's talk about China a little bit. One of the concerns about kind of decelerating growth in China is that it could potentially export deflation. Given the read-through into Europe and, and the United States, is that exporting deflation thought process something that might be welcomed by the ECB and the Fed? Yeah, it would be welcome, but we're not really seeing signs of that coming through uh, so far. I mean, a lot of the inflation we're seeing increasingly in the developed world, it's in services inflation, it's quite domestically generated. 
Uh, likewise, a lot of the deflation in China seems to be domestically uh, generated. So it's a reflection of weak domestic demand conditions there in contrast to very strong or stronger uh, domestic demand conditions elsewhere in the developed world. So we're not really seeing that uh, you know, transmission or spillover that one would expect, would have expected from China deflation into the rest of the world. So right now, I don't think it gives central bankers, uh, you know, in the U.S. or in the euro area a whole lot of comfort at this point that they can stop tightening here just because they're seeing this deflation coming through in China. You know, oil prices, yes, they have come off. We have recently revised lower our oil price forecast, but generally speaking, they're kind of holding in and certainly they're not coming off uh, very sharply to the point where it would be putting significant downward pressure on the outlook. Nora, in terms of kind of the read through for central banks, of course, every central bank is going to adhere and kind of cater their decision making to their own country. Last week, the conversation was about the Bank of Canada uh, and the Reserve Bank of Australia. What kind of precedent this week has the Federal Reserve set for central banks around the world? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it feels like we are following a little bit the playbook that we got in Canada and Australia in that those central banks. Uh, they did pause, and after a certain amount of time of pausing, they then restarted uh, rate hikes. So it's clear that central banks, even though they thought they could be in a situation where maybe they've brought their tightening cycles to the end, the data are not supporting uh, that kind of uh, end to tightening. And similarly, from the Fed, you know, we thought that, you know, this would have been the last hike in May, but actually now it looks like they're going to be pausing. Uh, uh, they paused this month, and it looks like they're going to be hiking again in July. So we have actually uh, revised our expectations, and we're now looking for one more hike in July. So it's very much a precedent that is now being set up, whereby maybe central bankers are slowing down the pace of tightening, but not yet comfortable enough that they can bring an end to rate hikes here. Yeah, we see something different in China and over in Japan, don't we? Uh, the, the latter of those we'll hear more about tomorrow. Nora, thanks very much. Thanks for joining us. Nora Sentivani of JP Morgan uh, with thoughts on the global uh, central banking conversation coming up and look at some of the market moving events that you need to watch out for today. This is Bloomberg. inside the boardroom. Let's suppose you, you win a proxy fight and or you just get invited onto the board. You go to your first board meeting and you're the person who's saying you can fix this company and all of the others on the board of directors are saying, well, we're doing pretty well. How do you get received when you start saying, here's what I wanted you to do? Well, first of all, we don't bring that to the boardroom. Our time is spent with the CEO, the chairman, the CFO, and share our plans with them outside the boardroom. We try never to solve an issue in a boardroom, okay? It's always be best done the day before, the week before, outside that room. We wouldn't be there if they really were doing well. So it's really hard for them to straight face and tell us we're doing well. Uh, and we present them with a plan. ask me all the time, what is the key to being a really good investor? And I tell them it's to surround yourself with and work with the best investors you can find. On Bloomberg Wealth, I'm going to take you to meet the greatest investors in the world, the people that I would like to have managing my money. Today, I would say perhaps only second to AI right now, which is AI has got so much going on that folks are so excited about it. Climate tech is the hottest area to, to be in.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. From Nvidia hitting $1 trillion in market cap to Apple's record close in more than a year, tech stocks are seeing a major boost this year. A, a key player in that, of course, is AI, artificial intelligence. Bloomberg's Emily Chang visited the offices of OpenAI, the architect behind ChatGPT, and spoke with OpenAI's investor, Reid Hoffman. I do think that the generative AI is the thing that has the broadest touch of everything. Now, which places are the right places to invest? I think those are still things we're working out now, obviously, as, as venture capitalists. Part of what we do is we try to figure that out in advance, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, years before other people seeing it coming. Um, but I think that there will be massive new companies built. It does seem, in some ways, like a lot of AI is being developed by an elite group of companies and people. Mm. Is that something that you see happening? In some ideal universe, you'd say, for, for a technology that would impact billions of people, somehow billions of people should directly be involved in creating it. But that's not how any technology anywhere, anywhere in history gets built. And there's reasons you have to build it at speed, but the question is how do you get uh, the right conversations and the right issues on the table? So do you see an AI mafia forming? <laughs> um, I definitely think that there is because uh, you're referring to the PayPal mafia. Of course. Uh, I definitely think that there's a network of folks who have been deeply involved over the last few years, um, will have a lot of influence on how the technology happens. Do you think AI will shake up the big tech hierarchy significantly? Uh, what it certainly does is it creates a wave of disruption. For example, with these large language models, in search, what do you want? Do you want 10 blue links or do you want an answer? In a lot of search cases, you want an answer. And, an, and a generated answer that's like a mini Wikipedia, that's a shift. So I think we'll see a profusion of start. One of them is gonna collapse? No, not necessarily, and it doesn't need to. The more that we have, the better. So what are the next big five? Uh, well, that's what I'm, we're trying to invest in. <laughs> That was AI investor and LinkedIn co-founder Reid Hoffman choosing his words pretty carefully there. Speaking uh, with Emily Chang, you can catch the full interview on The Circuit with Emily Chang. That's tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Kriti, let's take a look at some of the uh, movers pre-market. Yeah, there is going to be a lot uh, that you have to go through. Uh, let's start with the, the Lenar specifically because this is going to be a bigger home building stock that you were really keeping an eye on. LEN is your ticker here. They beat their order estimates, uh, which is really important as we talk about the housing market and really talking about uh, some of the stories that are really hitting the macro uh, uh, part piece of the equation, which is, at the end of the day, the Federal Reserve. How much denting are you going to see uh, from their extremely high rates? Well, Lenar says not a whole lot at the moment. Their three-month orders are, are actually coming in a pretty strong. CVS is another uh, stock I have my eye on, though, Anna. The healthcare story is so fascinating when it comes to kind of the United Health read through. It was one of the major decliners in weights yesterday uh, when it comes to just increased healthcare costs and that reading into the CVS health story, except it was defended over at uh, Cowan, really talking, or TD Cowan, I should say, saying that, look, this is not really going to have a read through into CVS, and that defense has pushed those shares higher by about 1%. And at the end of the day, Anna, we have to very quickly talk about Tesla as well. Those shares are moving lower, breaking their winning streak of 13 straight sessions. I imagine the Fed has something to do with that, down about 3.4%. So a lot going on on the micro front, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. Plenty happening on the micro front. Uh, in terms of things we're watching for today, the ECB has to be front and centre then, Chrissy, at least from a macro point of view. As we discussed with our guests a little bit earlier on, we're expecting a hike from the ECB, expecting a continuation of the hiking cycle, even though we have the Fed now on pause. Call it a skip. You call it a skip if you're Richard Clarida. You don't call it a skip, though, if you're Jerome Powell. Yeah, the skip versus pause language is very interesting. And, and I'm going to find it very interesting what the BOJ, what the ECB has to say when they're asked whether they have to consider a skip or a pause. How do they interpret that terminology as, of course, uh, reporters and investors alike really kind of comb through that language uh, very, very carefully? Yeah, we'll be watching the BOJ, of course, into tomorrow's session or through tomorrow's session. We'll hear from them tomorrow. Um, uh, the politics at play here, although interesting, the headlines that you broke down earlier on, suggesting perhaps a little bit more freedom of movement for the BOJ than could have been the case if we'd seen some bigger political change over there in Japan. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. RBC's Amy Wu Silverman joins the team. Uh, they'll also be talking to Megan Green, which is interesting. It's soon to be joining the Bank of England, of course. So lots of uh, interesting conversation, no doubt, 
to be had there. This is Bloomberg. so used to the fact that every time there's a problem, central banks come and ease. This has been the kind of playbook, you know, throughout my career, before that, after I left. Now we're in a very different environment. Central banks actually have to create a recession, in essence, to get back to price stability. So it's a complete reversal of the, uh, the modus operandi, in a sense, of central banks as they've known it for the last uh, several decades. So that's why it's, uh, it's not so much that they're getting something wrong. They're, they've now acknowledged that there is this trade-off, these costs to pay. But it's a completely different way of thinking about central banks, and it's a different role. Another way to put it is they have to be unpopular now in order to get inflation back down, where it used to be you could count on them each time to rescue you, to stabilize the system, to bring support. And that has shifted. And I think many people, even in the markets, have not quite understood in my mind how much we are now in a different regime compared to the last four decades, effectively. So, so it's what, an, almost an easing bias in the markets? How would you describe it? Uh, in the U.S., yes. And, and, and I think it's this, this idea, this almost pre-programmed idea, when there is a problem, i.e. potential recession, central banks will come and ease. On the David Rubenstein Show, peer-to-peer -peer conversations, I uncover the untold stories of the world's most successful leaders. Watch Wednesdays on Bloomberg Television. Today we decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. Jay Powell's made it really clear that right now the priority is inflation. This is about really pushing back hard against the recession consensus. They succeeded in what we expected, namely delivering a hawkish skip. We expect them to raise rates both in July and in September and to get to that half percent. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keene. After the Fed decides, we decide to continue forward here. John Farrell on assignment, three islands in Italy. Tough detail uh, for Mr. Farrell. Lisa here with me as we plow through a Thursday. Claims here at 830, but we're going to claim that yesterday was almost on the edge of history making for the central bank. I got it wrong. I was surprised. Perhaps this will mark the end of the rate hiking cycle, and that is really one of the themes that I keep hearing about in analyst notes, despite the hawkish rhetoric. Why, if they had such hawkish rhetoric and such hawkish projections, didn't they go that particular meeting? The polarity here, Morgan Stanley, Ellen Zentner just flat out comes out and says, and we heard soft landing yesterday from Seth Carpenter, Zentner says the Fed is done. Madison met life in, uh, over at Citigroup. They just simply say they just should have raised rates and forgot about all the hawkish, you know, the McKee jum mumbo jumbo we heard at 2 p.m. Well, at a certain point, if their actual projections, yes, they change, they become more hawkish, they increase their economic projection. We heard there from Jeff Rosenberg that basically they're gaming out just the scope of a potential recession or not, the sort of soft landing kind of scenario. 
but they didn't want to move and they didn't want to commit to a July mm. move. That to me was indicative of something. What matters right now, Lisa will brief you here in the coming 48 hours tomorrow, Bullard, Waller, and others as well. They start barking, I think, start speaking. <laughs> Bullard, it starts tomorrow. Are you prepared for this? It's your job, Lisa, to brief us on this madness. Well, I will definitely uh, have fun with all of that, as I'm sure you will as well. And actually, Jay Powell talked about yesterday. Listen to the Fed speak. They're all going to speak for themselves. I can't represent them. It was hurting cats, and you could kind of feel that under the hood, how yeah, to get to a consensus well yeah, in well a way said. without necessarily creating the appearance of uh, some sort of dissonance it, inside the members. And to the ECB today, and of course, Maria, today in Frankfurt, we'll have full coverage of that uh, different ballet in Frankfurt. But what is fascinating to me is how yesterday had the spirit of sort of, we have our own Bundesbank out there being hawkish, even though maybe the chairman wanted to be more like, say, Finland or, you know, pick another nation. But all of a sudden, we were sort of Bundesbanky yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious how much we end up with a euro breakout as we do get some uh, move today by the ECB and what the projections wow. are. Yeah, we're, we're definitely moving up. The other thing I want to note from yesterday, the fact that the Nasdaq rallied, even in the face of the potential for higher rates, to me, was a sea change. We have officially moved past big tech being interest rate sensitive. <clears throat> perhaps it's AI. Perhaps this is the new haven. <coughs> but this shows the nature of how this is the defensive yeah. trade in a new way. We're going to dive into that with Amy Wu Silverman here to start strong in the equity markets here uh, in a bit. I'm going to look at the data and suggest a little bit of a tempered red on the screen here in the markets. Futures, SPX, still about 4,400. That's all you need to know about uh, Chairman Powell getting out of the press conference relatively equity unscathed, the VIX 14.06. We've been looking at oil 68.93, thanks to Will Kennedy and our team uh, for reporting on that. And in the yield space, really don't know what else to say. We've got significant curve inversion out to 92 basis points, uh, the vanilla 210 spread, the 10-year uh, yield 3.81%. We're really not looking at a 4% level yet. But um, you know, the, the gyrations still continue uh, in bonds. Yeah, well, and the score, <clears throat> just to give you a sense of Fed fund projections, there now is Please. almost a 70% chance of a rate hike being baked uh, into uh, Fed funds futures uh, in the July meeting following and ending uh, the end of January. <clears throat> With 5.1%. All right, as far as Save today. Us with a brief. <laughs> John Harley Lawler. Game. John is Lawler be doesn't us. believe in the party. CFO game. of Ford at 7 30 a.m. Eastern. Very curious to hear what he has to say about Tesla and their charging stations, how much he's buying into that and what that means. Megan Green also joining us. She I'm really very thrilled uh, to have uh, her come on. She's joining next month as an external member of the Monetary Policy Committee over at the Bank of England. She is senior <coughs> economist at the Kroll Institute and uh, she teaches at Brown. And at 8.50, 15 a.m. ECB rate decision followed by 8.45 a.m. press conference with Christine Lagarde. Watch the euro. How much does that break out? And at 8.30 a.m., this data dump is important. You picked up an initial jobless claims. Yes, we get Empire Manufacturing, the first read on the month of June. But to me, retail sales, yes. incredibly True. important. How much is the momentum behind consumer spending continuing versus diminishing? 70% of the American economy. And, of course, we go to the control group on that. But the answer is that's a nominal statistic. So even if you say, a la Zentner, the Fed is done, if you get some form of sticky inflation, 3%, 4%, dare I say more, I'm talking about top-line inflation, then you get a top-line retail number, which is spirited and adds into nominal GDP and the rest. That's sort of the cycle on it. So we'll look at retail here carefully today. In the currency market, I do want to note uh, Ren Minbi, lots going on in China. We'll get to that through the show uh, today. I round it up. I got a 7.16 on Chinese uh, yuan. Amy Wu Silverman joins us now, head of derivative strategy at RBC Capital uh, Markets. Amy, it's real simple. You say we've got upside here, and we may not get the traditional equity market rotation. This is important to global Wall Street. Why will we not rotate? Yeah, th this is the question, you know, we've been asking the last few weeks, and I thought yesterday's knee-jerk reactions, Tom, were just really telling. 
So, you know, look for the last few weeks, the options market's been chasing upside in IWM, and then you get a little bit of a hawkish tone from the Fed and from Powell. And what happens? You have IWM sell off yesterday, you have Q's rally, you have NVIDIA rally. And I think that just tells you, you know, how the market is thinking about these different sectors. The one question we've been asking ourselves is, you know, if the data continues to come in more economically strong, is it possible essentially to have a narrative where it's not really about value versus growth or small versus large cap? It's simply tech becomes your rallying point because of a secular story, perhaps, and then IWM becomes more of an IWM story on the more defensive and, you know, that side, but both can rally at the same time. Just let's uh, really develop some of what you were talking about, this idea that big tech has become defensive, has become the second growth story and really perhaps the fear of recession is playing out in the small caps in a new way and even in some of the non-tech names which really highlights a diversification that is very different than it was six months ago yeah exactly and, and one thing I'll say is what has been interesting especially given yesterday is we saw IWM sell off sort of in that reaction to the hawkish tone from Powell but we didn't see any change in the option sentiment. So going into yesterday, Lisa, the option sentiment in IWM was quite bullish. You saw almost a skew inversion where that call demand is outweighing the put demand. And that's been true for the last few weeks when people think, you know, that small cap is going to kind of burst out. But that didn't change yesterday, even though we did see continued optimism in the large caps as well. So that's why I've been saying, you know, is it possible the narrative no longer becomes this rotation from small to large or from growth to value, et cetera? It's just simply they can go along two different tracks and two different narratives. So basically, are you saying that people who are talking about bad breath getting into some sort of broadening out, not happening, and it's not going to happen, even if you continue to get a rally in the equity indexes? Yeah, you, you said bad breath, not me this time. <laughs> I, I Yeah, I, I think that is possible. And the one major implication that has for volatility is one reason we've been counting on that breadth to widen is because it's going to change our correlation function, which obviously feeds into your index volatility. But if we don't get that happening, if you continue to have people who've missed out on mega cap tech having to reallocate into it, even as that small cap story is playing out, I don't think you get much of a change in correlation, which ultimately, you know, dampens volatility on an index level. So it's possible that, you know, you have all these events ahead, but there's that suppression of volatility because that correlation component of volatility continues to not move because of the breadth. Amy, if we believe in a bull market and we've had a first leg from October, I've been calling it the Ancompora Yardeni bull market after two people that were way out front on identifying it. If that's the first leg, how do you use the cross moments? How do you use derivative mathematics to assist in identifying the second leg of a bull market? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you one Bloomberg function that I like to look at a lot, which is VCA, which gives you the volatility landscape across you know, any constituents like the S&P 500. And when you organize that, Tom, by SKU levels, so again, that component of call demand versus put demand, you start to see where the really, really bullish parts of the market are. So if you looked at that right now, among your top 10 names, you know, probably not shocking to you is going to be AMD, it's going to be NVIDIA, it's going to be Tesla. And it really tells you not only where the market is out front the most on, but where it's beginning to start to see changes in sentiment. And you are starting to see some of the more, you know, IWM type names go in there into those sectors rather than it just right. being mega cap tech. Are the big names out there, whether it's a big name Procter & Gamble, the big name Walmart, Intel is a dog of the moment, or as you mentioned, AMD, are they under-owned by institutions in the traditional sense, not hedge funds, but long-only buy side? Are they under-owned in what's worked? They are, and that's part of the problem. There, there's sort of two interesting things. The first is that portion of the asset management community you've been talking about has been under-allocated. And the issue is that get, begets this positive momentum situation where we've talked about in options where you get that exacerbation of gamma. So essentially buying of calls can lead to more buying of stock, which can lead to more buying of calls. This is what you saw during the meme craze. And the other thing is, historically, that right. segment of the market has that problem with owning things in such a narrow concentration. So if the breadth of the market 
starts to expand that <clears throat> ultimately helps them in participating in the rally. Yeah, the headline there, folks, if you're keeping score at home, is Amy Wu Silverman says Apple is a meme stock. That's what we're going <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna to go <laughs> with you. there. If I get gamma is an acceleration, you know, within the derivative jargon, are we gamma are are we gammaing our way to a melt up? So, you know, we already have. That's already been happening, and I think that can continue. So when you look kind of to the, the week right post NVIDIA's earnings, that's what you saw. You saw those skew inversions, you know, on that VCA function. And then you continue to see that now that actually hasn't changed all that much, <clears throat> even though, you know, some people are asking if that AI rally is tired. You don't yet see that in the options. You continue to see that call and bounce pretty heavily. And then each day that goes by, we actually start to see it in different parts of the market, not just mega cap tech. And that's why I think it's very telling in terms of the sentiment and options. Those wins have really changed mm -hmm. over the last month. Amy was silver and terrific opening brief for us today with RBC at Capital Markets. Surveillance correction, we want to be clear on this. Apple is not a meme stock. I don't want anybody casting Thanks, aspersions. News you need to know. Uh, news you need to know <laughs> yeah. right now. What's so important in there, and this goes back to my conversation with uh, Nicholas uh, Nassim Taleb uh, here uh, uh, 10 days ago or so, is so much can be learned by studying the dynamics and the oscillations, if you will, of the consensus opinion. And that's what Amy Wu was talking about there. You've been saying that for a while, that Apple <clears throat> isn't under-owned by investment firms. And there's some data on that that I thought was really interesting, which actually confirms what you're talking about. Just to give you this, so Microsoft is 75% owned by investment companies. Apple share is 67%. So investment companies Brilliant. aren't Brilliant. as heavily uh, sort of weighted in the Apple shares as they are in the Microsoft shares, which raises exactly your question. Are people going to have to play catch up, adding some momentum? Well, they have to. And again, it's the active versus index fund. If you're an index fund and you own this stuff because you have to own it, and if it does well, up goes the index fund. And if you're running not a little bit of advanced math here, but if you're running an R squared of 9.2 or 9.3 or dare I say 9.5, you got to own it. But your perspective says, do we really want to own X percent of name the big stock? And that's the tension you get into that we heard there from Amy Wu. Uh, so this is way too much math for I was about to say R squared, 10 squared, <coughs> four, you know, yeah, thank Q, you. Q, 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 Q. Chicago constitutional <laughs> math. It's scary. <laughs> Futures at negative 14. Much to talk about. A senator from Pennsylvania, a former senator next. This is Bloomberg. So Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. Business Week Radio, live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talking. Come on, are you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more.
The top names in business are on Bloomberg. The energy in Shanghai was like New York on crack. Things are going to get worse in the economy at the same time as you have this internal conflict. We need more bipartisan conversations because this is an American issue. Are some of these assets commodities or are they securities? And we've been asking the SEC for a long time. But I think there's more problems under the surface. It's incredibly exciting, as important as the birth of the Internet. Nobody covers business like Bloomberg, your global business authority. Today we decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. We didn't make a decision about July. I mean, of course, it, it came up in the, in, the, um, in the meeting from time to time. I would say about, about July, two things. One, decision hasn't been made. Two, it, I, I do expect that it will be a live meeting. Chairman Powell there yesterday. Uh, really quite the comments there. I thought, you know, historically Mike McKee at 2 o'clock was absolutely stunning calling a super hawkish meeting and, and on we went. And you reviewed it br br brilliantly yesterday, Lisa. You said, you know, up, up, up went the markets and then they pulled back. Sort of a little constructive move to the end, but the markets, there was a flightiness to it almost. There's a bit the of skepticism, of in fairness, <clears throat> about whether they'll yeah. actually go through with the hawkish rhetoric or if this is job boning as a monetary policy tool. And I think that that's really the takeaway <clears throat> that I've heard in a lot of the analytic notes. Uh, what we're going to do is jump into a good conversation here on the politics of the moment for the United States of America. We do this, the futures is uh, negative 14, Dow futures negative 43. Patrick Toomey is one of our more interesting senators, a former senator. He is of Pennsylvania. The, it's his fault the Phillies lost, and he exited <laughs> after uh, that. And he joins us today. He's on the board of Apollo now, among other uh, good duties here in his former career. What's the biggest difference of moving from the August Senate of Washington into the private space? Well, there are a lot. Uh, having control of your own schedule is one of them. Uh, the uh, majority leader gets to decide when votes will occur, and you have to be on the floor in person to cast a vote. When you're out of the Senate, you have a lot more say in uh, what a you're huge, doing and where. a huge difference in the House right now, where there's one or two people away, and that changes it for Speaker McCarthy. And that can happen in the Senate also. Yeah. How much do you kind of feel like you wouldn't necessarily run if the dynamics were the same now as they were when you started in politics? Honestly, for me, I was in federal office for 18 years, um, 12 consecutive years in the Senate, and prior to that, a gap, and then six years in the House. For me, that was enough. I was ready to move on. I, I have no regrets. I mean, I really enjoyed and appreciated the chance to pursue the policies that I believed in, but I don't like the idea of being there forever uh, for anybody, myself included. So but I was ready to move on. You're cut from a different cloth. I mean, there's Morgan Grenfell, and then you're in Rookie's Restaurant, and, you know, Lehigh Valley and all that. But what you're really acclaimed for is standing up to the former president and saying the behavior is not appropriate. We have seen an absolutely historic moment for the nation that will continue right. in the coming weeks right. and, and months. What is the best practice right now of centrist Republicans as they address this indictment in Miami? Well, so I'm a conservative Republican, um, and my conservatism sort of requires me to call out the completely unacceptable and egregious behavior of the former mm -hmm. president as it manifests itself periodically. Um, look, I think Republicans should call it for what it is. This is a completely unforced, unnecessary, outrageous abuse of the responsibility that the American people gave this president. He knew those documents didn't belong to him, but it wasn't just... A, a, a sloppiness. It wasn't just a matter of, oh, okay, a few papers got mixed in with some of my mementos. Uh, it was lying about it. It was hiding it. It was suggesting to his lawyers that they um, make it disappear. It was discussing it in, in, in front of reporters, someone writing a book and recording this, and apparently, mm -hmm. if, if we can believe the allegations, which uh, I think they're there for a reason, uh, it included very sensitive military secrets of the United States of America. So, as is often the case, Donald Trump is his own worst enemy. He makes a foolish mistake and then compounds it massively. And, uh, look, this is indefensible behavior. I went back and looked at a September effort by Philip Bump in the Washington Post working off Pew Research, and I was thunderstruck at the countable research of how small MAGA is. It's not that great a part of the American pie. How does the broader sense of Republicans in independence 
not defend themselves, but just react, adjust, and move forward if MAGA's really not all that big. Boy, their megaphone's large. Yeah, but uh, the, the unfortunate reality in my mind is the president still, the uh, former president still does have a large level of support. And that's complicated, right? It's, it's, part of it is historical. Part of it is a sense of the, the grievances that he uh, fans. Uh, part of it is the perception that he's being unfairly treated. And so even if he did something wrong, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not a fair treatment. Um, so it's complicated. Here's what my theory is the cumulative weight of all of the drama, all of the unnecessary misery, all of the, the lawsuits, the allegations, all of this is going to cause increasing numbers of Republicans, even if they've been sympathetic to Donald Trump, to say, okay, maybe he did a good job as president. We got to move on. One of the rare things about you is that you can really dovetail from Washington to Wall Street, and that's sort of been your background going back and forth. And we're talking about the politics of the moment at a time when Fed policy is going to dictate a lot on Wall Street for the next couple of years. How concerned are you growing, given the politicization of the inflation debate? How concerned are you that this Fed is not really convicted enough to go through with their mandate and get inflation back down to where it should be. So I lean in the other direction. I think this Fed is very, very concerned about um, you know their legacy, their reputation. They know that they got this badly wrong. They kept rates way too low, monetary policy way too easy for way too long. They established a flawed paradigm for determining when they would change, they got behind the curve, I think the risk is that they overdo it. And partly for the same reason that they went too far. In my conversations with Fed governors and senior staff, I was always surprised at how dismissive so many of them are about money supply, how dismissive they are about what Milton Friedman taught us, and how focused they are on things like inflation expectations rather than the 40% growth in M2 that they were responsible for in 18 months. So. They might miss the collapse of the growth in M2, for instance, and misdiagnose what's going on, in my view. I think there's a great risk they go too far. Are you agreeing with Elizabeth Warren? Um, I don't think so, because I, I think Elizabeth Warren was opposed to any kind of normalizing of interest rates, I think. I may be a mischaracterization, but I think that's true. Um, we now have positive real interest rates, I would argue, you know, certainly if you're looking on a month-to-month -month basis. We have had money supply growth go to zero. Uh, we have the Fed uh, shrinking its balance sheet. We have the Treasury going to go out and absorb, what, a trillion dollars worth of cash from the economy. So you put all that together and you look at how inflation has obviously rolled over. Um, and I think we're probably on the right trajectory now. I'm not in the camp of easing by any means. I think the pause is probably the right thing to do. But you look at the dot plot mm. and it looks as though they're going higher from here. So maybe that's the right call. I'm just, I think the era is more likely to occur on excessive tightening. Bloomberg surveillance has a, a, a great affection for politicians who come from a different territory than just pure politics as well. I was talking to our Greg Giroux, and he looks at the mess which is known as the coming presidential campaign. Yeah. And I would just suggest, sir, that you consider here in your private moments, private citizen moments, that we need a LaSalle Academy ticket. Now, I think Governor Raimondo and Pat Toomey could get together <laughs> and bring Rhode Island to the nation. What's in the pixie dust at LaSalle Academy, Providence, Providence, Rhode Island, that gives us the Commerce Secretary and the former Senator? Uh, I think our Commerce Secretary is a very capable, uh, a very capable person, uh, one of the more impressive members of the entire administration. Um, but our worldviews still differ considerably. And uh, <laughs> I had a great experience at LaSalle Academy. It's a great school. Uh, but um, she and I won't be teaming up anytime soon. What's the world? <laughs> what's the worldview you see at the debates of the Republican Party? I believe they start in August. Oh, what is that going to the, be? There's like? some very big ones, right? And this is really important. There's what is our role in the world? I mean, you have a wing of the party that thinks we shouldn't even be helping Ukrainians. I think that's crazy. But but. There's people who are mm -hmm. advocating that. You have a... I think that's really fun. Senator as well. Thanks for having me. He is with Apollo, Patrick Toomey. He's a former senator of Pennsylvania. Please stay with us. Futures negative 16, Dow futures negative 65. Lisa, I, I heard a to Raimondo Toomey ticket there. I mean, <laughs> Definitely I just, not. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs>
for the first, you know, call it 18 years at Chipotle, this was you come into Chipotle along the line, you interact with the crew, and you customize your meal. We've got this separate make line, and it's digitized, and so the orders come in, and they're they're really kind of staged so that if you say at noon, I want to come in at one o'clock, we hold that order, and we send it to the crew like maybe 10 to 1 right. so it's ready right when you pull up your car how do you manage these kind of two different staffing needs right yes. and making sure you have the right amount of people yes. at the at the right right time we spend a lot of time uh, projecting sales uh, a lot of it is you know it's part art part science we're trying to bring more science and more ai into it because yeah. if you get the right sales projection then you know exactly what your sale what your digital sales and analysis about the companies you know and the startups to watch plus the interviews you don't want to miss watch caroline hyde and ed ludlow on bloomberg technology the only daily business show dedicated to tech right in the middle of the trading action 12 p.m on the east coast 9 a.m in the west only on bloomberg television your global business authority Surveillance. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen. Mr. Farrell, on assignment. So, do we know which island? Oh, you know, honestly, Sardinia? why do you call vacation assignment or holiday? It's on assignment. Because uh, I work all vacation. You know, I wear my suit, my bow tie, and, you know, assignment I got my floaties fun. on so I don't sink. And, you know, I I work, well, I'm American. I work all vacation. That's what we do. We do use you, a cell phone and, you know, you work. Do you have Hermes? I have a memory. Hermes True story. True story. Hermes. I was talking to Colby Smith about this yesterday at the FT. I'm at Sea Island in Georgia studying for CFA level two at, at the, 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 the beach table or whatever of Sea Island while we're vacationing. True story. Sounds, sounds fun. It's sounds just like a fun. Sick. Pharaoh does it better than we do. We welcome all of you on a really I mean, interesting we. Thursday uh, <laughs> after uh, a, a truly historic Fed meeting. There's no other way about it. Futures negative 15. Uh, yield space, I mean, all the little five basis point move back up in the two year. Flighty, as I would call it. I do want to point out important curve inversion. Two ten spread, let's call it negative 80 basis points. Now negative 92 basis points. Dare I say we can get one big figure, one full percentage point difference between the two-year and the 10-year, we're not there yet. No, and I'm watching the euro, and I'm partly because of what's going to happen with the ECB meeting later this morning, but also because of China and the additional rate cut that they announced overnight after weaker-than-expected retail sales, how much that's going to give Europe an additional pop on the heels <coughs> of already this sort of baked-in belief in the past couple of weeks that they were slowing down. I have to see just out a headline, and this really shows a defensive strategy of retail with retail sales coming out. Target, they boost their quarterly dividend 1.9 percent why boost it i yeah. mean i yeah i guess they do it to keep a to keep a sequence of dividend increases going like the bank of new york back to 17 uh, whatever but nevertheless there it is with a fractional boost as well why don't you set up the festivities from yesterday <laughs> well, yeah it was uh it was quite a press conference basically it seems like the theme has been the release comes out it tends to have a hawkish tone and jay powell takes the bite out of it gradually as he says in his calm tone that he's not committing to anything in July. Take a listen to some of the highlights. The skip, I shouldn't call it a skip. So it seemed to us to make uh, obvious sense to moderate our rate hikes as we got closer to our destination. I would just say it's a continuation of, of that process. We didn't make a decision about July. I do expect that it will be a live meeting. The conditions that we need to see in place to get inflation down are coming into place. But the process of that actually working on inflation is going to take some time. The risks to inflation are to the upside. Basically, trying to explain the awkward, hawkish skip, hawkish pause, whatever you want to call it, Tom, <coughs> as it's clear there is some disagreement 
on the committee about how much further they should go. I mean, that seems to be the theme when he said, we're not going to commit to anything in July. Right. The data will come in as the data comes in, whatever that means, and they will assess at that point. My summary of this is simple, and I'm going to go to the Richard Clarida interview that Kriti Gupta had here in the last hour, because Clarida advanced the conversation two or three weeks ago in a blistering essay in The Economist, really important about where are we heading? Are we going above 2%? I'll do this quickly, because we've got Will Kennedy on oil uh, waiting. Jason Furman is at Harvard. He's one of our best, best economists linking legit academic macroeconomics into policy making. He teaches Act 10 at a small school in the Cambridge River. The Federal Open Market Committee is signaling a baby step away from a belief in low equilibrium interest rates. The median long FFR, I have no idea what that is, was unchanged at 2.5%. But the central tendency shifted up from 2.5 to 2.675, whatever that middle point is. All three of the lowest long-run dots shifted up. Expect more of this shift over time. And that's where the former vice chairman exactly is, is there's going to be a language here of an institution that can't visibly shift up. Well, and we're talking about the neutral rate possibly being somewhat higher than what we've gotten accustomed to. And this goes to the heart of the question that a lot of people have. Why has this economy been so resilient to 500 basis points of rate hikes? Right. Is it just lag effects that haven't taken hold? Or is there something that's either less interest rate sensitive or more dynamic about the economy than anyone had previously realized? And it fits into the demand question globally, that IMF survey of sluggish economics out five years. Will Kennedy is familiar with this, driving all our hydrocarbon uh, coverage and Will Kennedy this morning enjoying $68.87 West Texas Intermediate. Uh, Will, thank you so much for joining us. One of our great themes from Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs, I'm Rita Sen, uh, it has been the idea that all of a sudden interest rates matter. We've got a higher interest rate regime, a legit coupon on short-term paper. How does that change the dialogue for Riyadh and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Well, I mean, obviously, it uh, is a destination for other, you know, it provides a destination for money. It means that there may be less uh, people putting their money into oil, um, and it may restrict the financial flows of money into oil. We do know that one of the uh, things that we've seen in the oil market this year is that the paper market, the financial market, has felt much more bearish than uh OPEC producers and oil producers and people who are in the physical market think is justified. And people talk about that disconnect, whether that's true or not, uh, is for others to decide. But people talk about that disconnect uh, between the paper market and the physical market, and that might be one reason. Amrita Sen was really forceful about that yesterday or the